Good morning, please maintain silence until the meeting begins. Good morning. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Water and Power Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. This proceeding is being broadcast on Channel 35. The exact broadcast times can be found by contacting Channel 35. Board of Water and Power Commissioners, please stay present for roll call. Commissioner Larere. Present. President McLean Hill. <coughs> present. Commissioner Neiman Brady. Present. Vice President Ruiz. Present. Four board members, a quorum is present. Madam President. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually don't have opening remarks today, although I would like to note that we are joined um, at this meeting by uh, Daniel Sosedo, I'm sorry, Daryl Sosedo, who's the president of the Latino Chamber of Commerce. Um, accompanied by a, a former Strategic Council employee, uh, Oman Valverde. I understand they'll be giving public comments, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, we will begin then with general, uh, if there are no remarks from any commissioners, we will begin with general comments. General public comments, I understand we have 13? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, speakers. Please be mindful that you will have two minutes for public comment. The first public commenter is Susie Shannon, who will be followed by Manny Cellini. Good morning, board members. <clears throat> I'm Susie Shannon with Housing is a Human Right in AHS. Um, Los Angeles is the homeless capital of the United States with over 69,000 people who are homeless here in the county. And we think that it's critical um, that we bring affordable housing online as quickly as possible. And I'm sure we all agree with that. Um, the DWP is a very essential part of that process. It's not acceptable for new affordable housing to wait two to four years for power. Um, also with Los Angeles prioritizing adaptive reuse, which is converting a lot of our older buildings um, for people who are unhoused, um, we also need to bring more power to a lot of these older buildings. It's also not acceptable to obviously wait several years for that power to be brought. Um, I'm sure you understand what the concerns are, um, but we can't have DWP be a barrier to housing or homeless community. Um, we also need to recognize that 100% affordable housing deserves lower income costs. Um, we can't always individually meter all of these apartments, and if um, a builder or a landlord is providing 100% affordable housing, we really need to bring down those costs so that um, we actually can provide this housing in Los Angeles. So we're just um, here to implore this board to create solutions to these barriers and to help us bring power to these buildings immediately to address this housing emergency. Thank you. The next speaker is Manny Cellini, who will be followed by Betty Toto. Pleasure to be here this morning. My name is actually Mary Cellini. Um, 
the city of Los Angeles has 41,000 people who are homeless. We need affordable housing built now. The LDWP needs to provide power immediately for affordable housing. The people remaining unhoused and on the streets is, is Los Angeles' biggest crisis, and I do hope that we can come to a, a remedy to help get power built, power in our buildings and our uh, adaptive needs. Thank you. The next speaker is Betty Toto, who will be followed by Ann Kim. Very sanitized, thank you. <laughs> um, well, my name is Betty Toto from Housing is a Human Right, um, an arm of AHF. Um, the city of Los Angeles is in a housing crisis. Um, we can just look out this 15th floor window. <laughs> and um, DP, DWP is delaying getting power um, to buildings that, that would and could provide affordable housing. Um, delays up to four years is quite ridiculous. Um, delays equal death. That's, that's just basically it. And about four unhoused people die on the streets of LA <clears throat> every day, every day, because they're living out in the streets in these conditions. Um, and this can be avoided if DWP does its part um, and expedite getting power um, to these buildings that are affordable housing. In fact, um, prioritize them. Uh, new developments and uh, whether it's adaptive reuse, um, please, we need this. This is, this is a, we're in a dire situation. Um, so please stop exacerbating um, the issue, move quickly and get a power, for, uh, power to affordable housing and power to the unhoused. Thank you. The next speaker is Ann Kim, who will be followed by Dominique Eastman. <clears throat> Hi again. Uh, my name is Ann Kim with AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I recognize all your faces. I'm sure you recognize me by now. Um, I won't, I won't um, reiterate um, what I've said before, but really, um, just to be clear, here's, here's what we're asking for. Number one, work with us to make the Lifeline program available to our tenants. They are the tenants that need that program. Um, let's not let, you know, individual metering or, or the, or, you know, just the, um, the trivial, trivial things um, get in the way of providing this program to our tenants. And number two, we are, we are actively buying buildings. We are actively in adaptive reuse to try to get more affordable units um, to our tenants. But we are, um, we are just um, the delays. So we have a building right now with you know, 200 units, almost 200 units ready to house folks except for the power, <laughs> except for the power. Now, that's, isn't, isn't that really a sad state of affairs? Please help us. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speaker is Dominique Eastman, who will be followed by Ashoki Talukdar. Good morning, y'all. Uh, I'm Dominic Eastman, um, Regional Operations Manager for AIDS Healthcare Foundation, AHF. Uh, good to see you all. Seen me before. I'm back at it. I'm, I'm just going to reiterate what my colleagues are saying. Um, we need power, um, and, and we want to, to, you know, we want to be able to provide more affordable housing for people. Each and every last one of our residents qualify for the Lifeline program. That's just the fact. Um, we operate at 98% occupancy year round. We have buildings that we are buying and we're coming open. Uh, maybe it was a bad idea for AHF to get into the fight of housing because at every turn, we're getting pushed back. It's no help. Nobody, it seems like nobody cares but us. Um, people cry to me that are unable to apply for certain type of subsidized programs that come to housing with us. We help the unhelpful. There is a class of working poor that you can come to AHF and live without a roommate. We make this possible. And do I think it was a bad idea? Yeah, it was a bad idea. I don't know why we're still in it, to be honest, because 
there's no assistance, there's no help, and the, the prices are against the roof. We have so many boundaries and so many challenges. I see why there's so much homelessness, because nobody cares. If you're not rich or if you don't have a living wage, and the living wage is over $75,000 a year. I mean, things are, there's constraints, there's construction going on. These aren't affordable houses. These are laws. And yes, LA is about to be the capital of sports, you know, the worldwide capital. But you still have people that need help. And we're just asking if you can help us increase the fight to eradicate homelessness. And we know that it's not going to be perfect. We're probably going to still have pockets of homelessness. However, we have doors we, that are open, and we want to continue to keep filling them. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speaker is Ashoki Teladar, who will be followed by Mark Dyer. Good morning, everyone. Ashok Talukdar, Deputy General Counsel for AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, certainly, it's not my desire to make myself a familiar face here, but it certainly is going to look like the, it's going to be the case. Uh, again, um, what excuse can I say? me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm not sure how many people are involved in this presentation, um, but um, and we typically don't engage in public comment um, a lot or actually at all. But the last time you were here, I did indicate that I wanted to meet with your group. Um, and I don't know that I heard from you and we may have dropped the ball, so I'm, I'm good with that. I just wanna say this, there is um, no lack of concern um, or recognition of the priority related to providing housing for the unhoused in the city of Los Angeles by any member of this board. That's one. Two, um, you know, I spend a lot of time at this department, as do other commissioners, <laughs> driving home the um, sense of urgency around addressing issues of significant public concern. Um, I am well aware, I know we are all aware of how frustrating and counterproductive and difficult bureaucracy can be. Um, what I would like is for you to work with David Rahimi and who, if he's not in this room, I'm sure is somewhere within the sound of my voice. He is our policy lead on our staff um, to set up a both tour of your facility for me and any commissioner that would like to be on that tour. I will make sure that I bring appropriate staff. In addition to that, um, Marty, um, I'd like you and Brian and others to join in a meeting that we will convene, but again, you're gonna need to work through our staff to get it on calendar so that we can start to um, better understand and determine how we can address some of these issues. Uh, among the first matters that I was involved in around affordable housing on this commission was to press the department to change its ADU policies. That was a couple of years ago, and Marty, um, that was one of the first things that he oversaw as a policy change when he became, I think, general manager. Um, so, we are willing to work with the affordable housing community in general to deal with a number of issues. We are already internally looking at solutions for a number of these issues. The reason that I am speaking is because you know, I don't think that this is the time for us to observe the sort of traditional bureaucratic niceties when we are talking about a human crisis. Um, I don't want people to leave with a sense of either hopelessness or a sense that we can't move, won't move, or don't hear you. It's not just you. There are a range of public um, of entities and private sector entities that are looking for some evolution of how we do business. So 
I'm, I know I've taken up your time. If you want to continue to talk to us about this, I don't intend to and don't need to stop the public comment, but I do just want to move this forward. So um, David will take the lead in getting both a tour set up and also um, pulling together a meeting um, that uh, I and any other commissioner, only one other can come, would like to attend so that we can start a discussion in a forum that actually can result in some productive outcome. Um, and that's all I have to say about this for now. Well, uh, President McLean Hill, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was very kind and very considerate. Uh, Mark. Uh, if you would please. Um, I will only conclude my uh, public comments with with a, a little uh, uh, follow up with what Anne was just saying and what Dominique was just saying that there are people who are waiting to occupy our premises. We have rooms available. Uh, LASA and its partner organizations, especially PATH, who provide supportive assist supportive permanent housing. Uh, permanent supportive housing, rather. Uh, they are waiting to occupy these buildings, but we can't offer them the rooms because of power. So uh, I'm really, really heartened to hear that, that we're, we're, we're going to be forming a close relationship to solve this problem. But you are absolutely correct. It is a crisis, and we need to solve the crisis. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's Mark Dyer. I'll just reiterate what our colleague said. I've reached out to an individual you pointed me to, and I've left several messages for, with Marty, to uh, work with us. And on that last meeting, the meeting before, you said reach out to Marty and work with him. I've left a couple of messages. I have not heard back from anything, but if you're going to refer us to David, I will coordinate with David. We will get the tour set up, and we'll move forward. Thank you so much. Right. I appreciate that. The next speaker is Mickey Jackson, who will be followed by David Bond. Hello, Mickey Jackson with AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I was very heartened by your words. Thank you very much. I think it's just what we need. And I think we need to get started now. And I thank you for your willingness to do so. And you will be hearing from us, I promise you. David's in the back of the room standing. The next speaker is David Bond, who will be followed by Jose Perez. Good morning, board. My name is David Bond. Uh, I'm a member of the Alliance for Change, and that's currently uh, IBEW members that are running for the board of directors for Local 18. Uh, some of the concerns that we've had were respectful responses from our union representation, and the same request I have as a field employee is from our management in, out in the field on the power side. We've made many requests for new equipment or new tools or updated or modernized and quite a few of them have fallen on deaf ears. While I was handing out election information out of Lincoln Heights, I gave uh, one of the employees driving a tree trimming truck out and I go, wow, how old is this truck? And the 34 year old said, older than I am. The contractors we hire have brand new information and state of the art equipment that has been shown to us multiple times by them. I do not understand why this multi-billion dollar corporation does not have those, that same equipment available for us to use in the field. Now, the staffing scenario. I currently work, or most recently worked up at the Pine Tree Wind Farm. There were 16 employees to fully staff that facility. There are now four employees left trying to maintain 50% of the 90 wind turbines out there operational, which is not working where they're working as hard as they can, as much as they can. Why cannot we staff our building and our jobs with ourselves? The last management chart that I saw that came down was so complicated and confusing, there were scores of new managers added, and we had no additional field employees to assist us in getting the work done. Not understanding how that occurs, we need more field personnel. Why aren't we training us? 
We know how. We've done it before. That's how we got here. Don't understand. Uh, we do want to make sure, I mean, and on that org chart with the management, I also noticed that many of those positions are vacant and have been for a year. If the position has been vacant for a year, does it need to be filled? Can't those duties and responsibilities be delegated to others? Uh, sir, I think your two so minutes is I'm, up. I'm up with the two minutes. Thank you very much, and for addressing these concerns, appreciate your assistance. The next speaker is Jose Perez, who will be followed by Daryl Saceda. Good morning, uh, President uh, McLean Hill, uh, members of the uh, commission. My name is Jose Perez, and I'm the president and CEO of a national group called Hispanics in Energy. We've been around for 10 years. We're uh, headquartered in Sacramento, uh, and uh, we've done a lot of work out here uh, with many, many wonderful people, including Ms. Sutley, who's uh, uh, present. And so uh, over the, uh, we were created by utility commissions uh, from other parts of the country. They said, look, the Hispanic community is growing so quickly in America, and it's such a large portion of America, that we need to figure out how to make it more inclusive in the energy sector, which in totality is like a $3 trillion uh, area. So uh, over the years, we've been working with our friends uh, across the country in states, mostly with utility commissions and with IOUs. Uh, but more recently, we uh, started focusing on munis, uh, and uh, we're very happy to uh, to say that CPS Energy from San Antonio is one of our newest partners. Uh, and so given the population of the LA area of, of Latinos, uh, it's so significant. It's like the largest concentration of Latinos in the whole country is right here. And so what we want to do essentially is introduce ourselves, uh, tell you that our mission is very simple, which is to integrate the Hispanic community in the energy sector. We work with uh, all the above energy. Uh, and I am uh, also an ambassador to the Department of Energy, uh, and uh, recently uh, Secretary Granholm appointed me to the National Petroleum Council. Uh, I think I'm the first Mexican-American to sit on that council. And so uh, things, things are changing, but they're changing slowly. Clearly our community is interested in figuring out how to accelerate some of that. Uh, we know some of the challenges. We've gotten very deep into uh, the areas that we want to focus on, which is one, supplier diversity for Hispanic-owned businesses. We have an MOU that we uh, did with the uh, United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that we're engaging, and so we're very uh, lucky to partner up with Daryl uh, Salceda here in uh, L.A., but we partner up with all the chambers around the country. Uh, uh, we also are focused on workforce. The challenge for our community, like the African-American community, is the number of energy STEM graduates that we have coming out of the schools. So just last week, we partnered up with HACU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. They represent uh, 560 uh, Hispanic-serving institutions, of which LA County has a whole bunch of them. And so we have Excuse been Excuse me, Speaker, your two-minute time allotment has expired. Okay, well, basically, I just want to uh, tell you that we would love to figure out a way to partner up with the uh, EWP. Uh, we see you as a, a leader. We think that we can add value to the work that you do and to uh, serve your customers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Robert, Mr. would you please make sure that you check in with this group? The next speaker is Daryl Saceda, who will be followed by Olman Valverde. Yes, good morning, Commission. My name is Daryl Salceda. I represent the Los Angeles Latino Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we represent over 2,000 local Latino businesses in the area. And I'd like to see, you know, um, thank you, um, Madam Vice President, and I met Sergio Perez at an event, and I'm looking forward to a partnership of bringing local businesses um, to work with the Department of Water and Power to see how we could... Uh, uh, let's see how we can work all work together. I also represent um, LA County. I'm also the commissioner. I mean, I'm also the chairman of the board of workforce development as well. So I just see that, you know, um, uh, providing work for our local businesses will only impact our commerce and our community, our surrounding community. So um, I just wanted to share with the group that I'm looking forward and let's see how we can get going. I made it two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the next
next speaker is Oman Valverde, who will be followed by Victor Sanchez. Good morning, my name is uh, Oman Valverde. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Madam President and uh, members of the board. Uh, so I'm on the board of directors of HIE and serve as the corporate secretary. You know, growing up, I didn't think about having a career in the energy space. I kind of fell into it by accident. Excuse me, Speaker, what is HIE? Hispanics and Energy. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, uh, uh, I'm here with uh, okay. Jose Perez. This one, uh, so I, I kind of fell into this by accident. You know, uh, basically, I was introduced to a lawyer who brought me into this firm, <clears throat> and that firm did a, dot, did a lot of oil and gas law. It, this led for me to a 10-year run, you know, doing oil and gas law, and it turned out to be something for me that was, you know, really good for my career. Made me a much, a much better lawyer. You know, how, however, I wish I had known about the energy space much earlier in my career, which brings me to here and why I'm with HIE. Uh, we want to bring the message to young people today that they can have amazing and rewarding careers in the energy sector. As we just mentioned, HIE recently signed an MOU with HACU, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. And the focus of that co collaboration is to promote and enable access to STEM energy careers to students enrolled in HAKU member institutions. In addition, HIE has proposed to the legislature, to the PUC, and to utilities to create a California Energy STEM Council. Uh, the goal of this effort will be to produce 25,000 energy STEM graduates per year from the 171 Hispanic serving institutions in California. And we want to get there you know, as soon as possible. So just to close up, you know, we're hoping to have a D DWP as a partner in our efforts, and we also want to be a resource to, to you to help your efforts to build diversity and inclusion in your organization. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you all. I appreciate uh, your presence here today, and especially the <coughs> message that you bring forward. Our director of uh, DNI is here and um, has already made contact. We. Um, the issues you raise are issues that we are deeply committed to and um, are looking for effective partners uh, to help us advance them. So very much appreciate your comments today and you're making yourselves both uh, available and uh, making sure that we're aware of the work that you're doing. So look forward to working with you. And Madam President, I'm happy to uh, have a follow-up meeting with the group. Excellent. The next speaker is Victor Sanchez. Uh, commissioners, Board Commission President McLean Hill, staff and representatives. My name is Victor Sanchez. I'm the new project director at Lane for the Repower LA Coalition. Uh, I wanted to come by this morning just introduce myself. I'm excited to continue the working relationship we've had uh, on addressing some of the most pressing issues for frontline communities and ratepayers. I wanted to also just come and reaffirm our commitment to centering equity and access as part of the conversation towards reaching our clean energy goals that have been set out by the LA 100 study. Um, I want to acknowledge and appreciate the space that was given to one of our key issues, utility shutoffs. Uh, I look forward to finishing that conversation and coming up with a policy that works for our most vulnerable rate payers. Uh, more broadly, our coalition is also looking forward to help craft a more equitable rate structure. Uh, we're committed to the most aggressive infrastructure and modern grid that we need to combat the, the climate crisis, but we strongly believe that we also need the tools to address the rate inequities uh, that will come with future hikes. Lastly, I just want to end by underscoring the importance of investing in our workforce inf infrastructure. Uh, so whether it's the expansion of the utility pre-craft trainee program or a conversation about uh, new direct install programs, we're here to partner with you in ensuring uh, that clean energy jobs are high road jobs, and most importantly, union jobs. Uh, that we look out for our existing workforce, but also invest and expand access to higher road jobs for frontline communities. So I'm very excited to keep the conversation going and look forward to meeting with you all individually in the near future. Thank you so very much. Public comment is now closed. Uh, terrific, thank you. Uh, Next uh, up is a report uh, by our general manager and chief engineer, Mr. Adams. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna turn the bulk of my report over to uh, to the senior AGMs. First, I'd like to start with Anselmo Collins to bring the board up to speed on issues pertaining to the drought and some of the conservation measures, as well as uh, update on the latest uh, meeting with Owens Valley. Go ahead, Anselmo. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Marty. Good morning, commissioners. Um, on the water supply uh, update, uh, the new water year began October 1st. So we're now in a new water year. Unfortunately, the forecasters are predicting uh, another dry year, which would make it the fourth dry year in a row. As a matter of fact, the Department of Water Resources has indicated that the first allocation, which will be in December for water, more than likely be 0%. So that means no water from the state water project. So thank you to our customers for continuing to reduce their water use at record levels. We actually achieved a 9% reduction in consumption in September compared to September of 2021. So this marks the, basically the fourth month in a row that we um, have record setting uh, water use in at the LDWP service area. And as you know, on June 1st, we implemented the two day a week watering and um, the September numbers basically are the lowest since 1970 when it comes to water consumption. So certainly our customers are listening to us and are you know, doing um, their part to conserve water for the city. So our customers record low water use in September is especially commendable because as you may recall, during the Labor Day weekend, uh, we had some pretty hot days. And despite that, we still saw a pretty significant reduction in our water conservation efforts. Uh, also our DWP customers responded really enthusiastically to a new program. We launched the Flume, which is a smart uh, home water monitoring device that you strap onto your water meter and you have access to your consumption instantaneously to your Wi-Fi. As a matter of fact, uh, since the program launched, we've actually had over 4,100 Flume devices that have been sold to our department customers. I guess oh. the commissioner has purchased one of them and hopefully it's installed and working properly. We just got it, haven't installed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Halfway there. So report back at the yeah. next meeting. <laughs> yes. So, and also uh, something else is that starting October 1st, we increase our rebate for the turf replacement program from $3 per square foot to $5 per square foot. Our hope is to basically start moving that needle and getting more people um, interested in replacing their water thirsty turf with drought tolerant material. Um, the next thing I wanted to report is also a new recycled water filling station. I think at a previous board meeting, I mentioned that we had two recycled water filling stations. Well, this past Saturday, we opened a third one. The great thing about it is the first one in the San Fernando Valley. This one is located at the Delano Park. So the three that we have is one at the LA Glendale Water Reclamation Plant. The second one is at the LA Zoo at the parking lot. And now the third one is at Delano Park in Van Nuys. So we're really excited to have that third location and we continue to look for additional locations to do this. So uh, you could expect to see more of these uh, popping up and I will be uh, commenting on those in the future. Uh, moving on, uh, on October 13th, uh, uh, Commissioner McLean Hill or Board President McLean Hill, as well as Commissioner Neiman Brady and the general manager attending the LA Inyo Standing Committee meeting. This meeting took place in Independence, California. But in addition to the meeting, we took the opportunity to have a tour. It was a tour of some environmental mitigation work that the Department of Water and Power is responsible for. One was at the Independence and Springfield Mitigation Project, and the other one was at the Black Rock Waterfowl Management Area. And I think we all agree that it was very interesting to see those two projects and the success that we've had in, in impacting the environment there in, in Owens Valley. And the last thing that I wanted to, to mention is uh, a job fair. So we held an Owens Valley job fair on October 20th. And this was done by Corporate Strategy and Communications, as well as Recruitment Services, and my aqueduct staff up in Owens Valley. It was hosted, um, it was about approximately 50 participants. It was done virtually. And we had several members of my team that were there to talk about their experiences working for DWP. We had Wendy McGee, Jacqueline Padilla, as well as Jason Crapson that gave their perspectives on what it is to work and live in the Eastern Sierra. The Owens Valley Job Fair provides local residents with a list of all job opportunities at DWP that are available locally and walks them through also the, the process of navigating through the civil service hiring process, which we know can be a challenge at times. So we try to put that in plain English so they understand exactly what they need to do to be successful. Job force development events like this uh, have proven to be very effective for us. We have seen an increase in local residents in the Owens Valley responding to these open applications for positions like maintenance and construction helper and others. 
And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Osama. Go ahead, Brian. Brian will tell us about uh, what's going on in the power system with the Lyman's Rodeo in particular. All right. Thank you, Marty. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Wait a minute. More Lyman's Rodeo? <laughs> well, this is the result of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, actually, the one you saw was the one locally. This is the actual national competition. I see. So I'm just you know, still waiting for the massive event for the women of the department. <laughs> So, um, again, go ahead. <laughs> well, so I, I will start with that. And um, so the 38th annual Lyman's Rodeo in Kansas City that happens every year um, that we send our teams to uh, happen on the 15th of this month. Um, and I'd like to bring up David Hansen and uh, Kevin Mount. Dave's the assistant director for power transmission distribution and uh, Kevin Mount's the manager of our southern districts. And they both participated uh, and brought the teams to Kansas City this year. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, Madam President, commissioners. I'm Dave Hansen, Assistant Director of Power Transmission and Distribution. With me is uh, Kevin Mount, Manager of Southern Districts in the same division. And we brought a couple of our superstars with us. Come on up, guys. Uh, like Brian said, we were all recently privileged to attend the 38th Annual International Lyman's Rodeo in Kansas City. Uh, we sent four journeyman electrical teams, uh, five apprentice teams, one of which was sponsored by our partners in labor, uh, IBW Local 18. You can see Mr. Lozano's here. Thanks, Louis. Um, uh, next slide, please. So there's a couple of photos of the apprentices and the journeyman teams in action doing their thing. Uh, next slide. The weather was beautiful, and there were young families all over the place. Everywhere you looked, there was baby strollers. Uh, there's an esprit de corps that comes along with being a line worker that uh, is unique to that group. Uh, it was great to see. Um, Kevin? So, um, good morning, uh, Madam President and Commission members. Pleasure to be here. Nice to see you again. <laughs> good to see you. Thank I you. didn't know it was the 15th. I would have tried to get out there. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, with us are uh, two of our EDMTs, which are electrical distribution mechanic trainees. Uh, they're both four steps. Uh, they're fresh off their stellar performance at the uh, International Alignments Rodeo uh, that, that we're viewing the pictures of. So um, on my left is uh, Dominic Vizgara. Um, he finished third place overall in the municipal division. So uh, Dustin Rose uh, on my right, also a fourth step. Uh, he finished second place overall in the municipal division. So these wow. gentlemen... Uh, got up on the podium to represent us, right? <laughs> advance to the next slide, we have a picture. <clears throat> next slide, please. <laughs> so here they are enjoying their moment, right? And of course, we're all there supporting and, and so proud, right? Um, of note, while our uh, journey level teams did not reach the podium this year, um, we had some highlights, right? And one of them I want to mention is uh, a father and son team, uh, the Reagans, uh, Charlie uh, Reagan, he goes by C. Joy and his son, Blake. Um, Charlie was appointed in February of 2011 as an EDM. Uh, his son was appointed in August of uh, 2021. So a very special moment and proud mom, Lauren, was there supporting the whole family, right? It was great to see. Um, yeah. Another quick note, I, you know, brief is good, I know, and I'm not being brief, but uh, I'm also no, proud fine. to say <laughs> that uh, one of our other teams um, with Mr. Chad Dressler and uh, Christopher Serta, um, they had a team put together, and uh, one of their team members uh, had a baby, right? So we had to find a replacement at the last minute. <laughs> but these gentlemen, these gentlemen competed in our LADWP rodeo that I remember seeing you at, and you as well, Marty, right? And, and some of the other folks. Um, they had the foresight to compete while they were apprentices at the journey level to allow them to go to Kansas City and represent the department. So although they did not get on stage or the podium, um, I'm super proud of them uh, for their accomplishments. And they just broke out at the end of September. They broke out September 26, 22. So that's why they had the foresight. Thank you for your time. 
Very good. And if you guys see in that picture there, uh, that lightning is not part of the drawing. It was actually captured. Uh, it's called the Lyman's Glow. Is that right, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that. Yeah. So. You don't see uh, it. Sorry, Brian. You don't see mine? So the final slide is a, a picture of all the judges' uh, support. Uh, there's a whole team. Uh, management, oh. IBW, and the friends and family of all the uh, com competitors. Thank Ma you. Madam President, can we hear from both uh, Dustin and Dominic? I'd like to hear from them. They've both prepared five minute speeches. Come to the microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you very much. Um, it was a big honor to be a part of that and to accept that award. It was one of the best feelings to have all those guys up there cheering. They took uh, they took over that um, that conference room or the um, whatever that room was. Um, but it was a great moment. And also, I don't know if you guys are aware, but I, I was pretty proud of the first place. It was the only woman apprentice competing, and she took first. That was pretty. I, I was glad. <laughs> I was glad to take second behind her. I was real proud of her. <laughs> Yeah. What he said. <laughs> no, uh, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great way to showcase what LADWP is really capable of, especially with not only me, but two people up there placing overall for municipality. It's a great feeling, and especially like walking off the stage, everyone knows who LA is. <laughs> so we have like even different unions shaking our hands, saying congratulations. I couldn't do that when I was an apprentice and stuff. So it was really nice. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And the uh, the young woman that uh, placed number one, she, she was Canadian, so we were immediately on. Um, first, thank you and congratulations. And um, in addition to uh, the incredible uh, uh, display that you all put on in, in the context of the rodeos and the competitions, I just have to say that I am in awe of what it takes to become uh, a line person at LADWP, having uh, the most eye-opening part of my work as a commissioner was visiting the training facility. And I left there happy that I had gone to law school <laughs> because I did not think that I would be capable of mastering all, I mean, forget the physical side of it. I mean, I could kind of, you know, when I was younger, take that on. But the um, the technical side of it was just so uh, so intense and so specific and and uh, required so much uh, so much expertise. And that you know, it's just not something that we uh, often talk about or celebrate. So, in addition to the just incredible um, display of uh, physical ability that it takes to do and to compete and to succeed and win and to do the work that you do. Uh, it just also takes this incredible breadth of knowledge, uh, especially I think I was uh, overwhelmed by the range of equipment <laughs> that you have to be competent in just because of the um, the range of stuff we have out in the field. So I uh, really, really, really respect all of your work and, uh, you know, and celebrate every opportunity that you have to show it off. Uh, so thank you and congratulations. Is there anything uh, else from the commission? Good job. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. That's all, Martin. <laughs> I'm going to end on that. Uh, Ryan brings us good news. Thank you. I, I would like to point out I was just with uh, the large public power council uh, over the weekend um, at one of the semi-annual meetings. It's the 28 of the largest public power agencies in the country. And, uh, you know, finding folks of this caliber to do line work, uh, both uh, men and women, is a challenge you know, throughout the country, something that we're all struggling with and uh, looking for ways to, to build workforce and uh, ideally you know, be able to hire a lot of folks locally who want to work in this area. So we're continuing to work on that, and it's a, it's an industry-wide effort that's going on. So hopefully we'll see some more success in that area. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to put out for the board, um, I know there's been a lot of uh, interest in the board about 
uh, issues pertaining to a Great Basin Air Pollution Control District and, and our work on Owens Lake. Uh, we did uh, uh, file a, a week ago uh, a lawsuit against Great Basin. It'll be discussed more in closed session because there will be uh, articles coming out, I think, in the LA Times uh, probably by this weekend about this. Um, we felt it was critically important, and I think the board had expressed that to us, that, um, uh, that we challenge what we believe is an illegal order uh, issued by Great Basin in an effort to uh, uh, collect fines uh, and uh, and uh, try to occur, force us to do a project which does not only not comply with the law but also not in their own regular their own agency rules and so um, we did file that Great Basin also filed uh, another lawsuit with us after they were unsuccessful in Superior Court with their initial order they tried to they've tried to change your order to a different code and, and filed a complaint against us as well. So that'll be ongoing, we'll discuss, but it is something that we think is very important to protect our ratepayers against uh, basically not only just runaway regulation, but also regulating outside the bounds of the law. And we think it's very important for our, to protect our ratepayers who are, who are paying the bill for all this and, and uh, are expecting us to, to work in their, in their, uh, on their behalf. So with that, this is the conclusion of my report. Okay, thank you so very much. Uh, do we have comments from the ratepayer advocate at this time? Uh, we'll make comments as needed on the uh, presentations and if issues arise on any of the specific uh, items. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I. Uh, have I inadvertently skipped introduction of motions. Um, Commissioner Nima Brady. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lair and I will be working with staff uh, to bring forth a motion as it relates to makeup water um, in various bodies of water within uh, LADWP service area. Um, in particular, the, there's a draft EIR um, out on, um, or I guess it's an actual EIR, on uh, the Silver Lake Reservoir Complex. And I, I think that we need to create a policy uh, around the makeup water, and so we'll be working um, with the staff to, to put together a motion around that. Um, terrific, thank you. I look forward to uh, to that uh, policy coming forward um, as expeditiously as possible. Um, in addition, um, at the next board meeting, um, I will be introducing a motion relative to um, uh, shutoffs for low-income residents. Um, so uh, you should expect to see that in your board package. Uh, is there anything else with respect to introduction of motions? Uh, seeing and hearing none, we'll move to uh, discussion with neighborhood councils. Uh, board Secretary, are there any um, impact statements? There are three impact statements that we received. The first is from the North Hills West Neighborhood Council, the second from the Reseda Neighborhood Council, and the third from the Northridge East Neighborhood Council. These community impact statements have been published on LADWP.com for the public record and were provided to all commissioners. Madam President. Thank you so very much. Uh, we're now going to take up items uh, that are recommended for approval. Um, we are, let's see, item L2 has been called special by uh, Vice President Ruiz. Um, L4 is being deferred. Are there any other items that we are, uh, let me just look really quickly, that are being deferred at this time? I'm sorry, which one did you say? Um, L4 is deferred. And, and what the one before that? L2 is being called special. Can we do uh, one as well? Okay, we'll also call L1 special. Um, is there a motion then for items L3, L5, uh, L6, and L7? So moved. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved in seconds. Uh, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Larere? Aye. President McLean Hill? Um, aye. 
Commissioner Neiman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Four ayes, motion adopted. Uh, terrific. Uh, then with that, uh, we'll move to uh, management reports. The first uh, report we have is uh, the integrated human resource plan from Power System. Brian, you want to leave that off? Yes, I'd like to start. You know, there was an initial slide there. If you could put that, that first slide, the introductory slide up first. Thank you. So just a, a, a brief intro, um, we're going to present a, essentially an update on our integrated human resource plan today. Um, and when we look at our five major um, power system initiatives um, and how they all tie together, and I think this is something that we're looking on how we're gonna bring this all together moving forward. Um, so in March, we came through with our PSRP um, reports. And then again, in October, uh, last board meeting, our SLTRP, our strategic long-term resource plan. Um, and next is our update on our integrated human resource plan, which we're going to go through today. Um, moving toward to our November meeting, we want to bring back our strategic transmission plan um, and essentially tie all these together. Our equity strategy plan will be coming uh, early into next year in 2023, um, but we'll be having a, an update. We had an update back in March, but we'll have a continuous update on that and how that ties everything together. Um, moving that forward, right, the next piece is going to be uh, the budget process approval um, on how much all of this is going to cost, essentially. Um, so I just wanted to give this a, a little, a, a brief, um, how all this ties together and which, how each one of these plans tie to each other. So um, for our strategic, or I'm sorry, for our integrated human resource plan, um, I would like to bring up Simon Zudu. He's the Director of Transmission Planning, Regulatory and Innovation Division, um, and he'll introduce his team to go through the resource plan. Good morning, commissioners. Um, uh, as you know, power system is undergoing a uh, transformation um, uh, that requires an unprecedented uh, build out of its generation, transmission, and distribution infrastructure. Uh, the findings of the LA 100 study, our local mandates to reach 80% renewable energy by 2030, our goal to reach 100% clean energy by 2035, and our impending uh, electrification of our transportation and building sectors will require, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the power system to attract, develop, and maintain uh, a high-performing, an engaging, a flexible, and diverse workforce with the skills needed to adapt to the workforce changes that we will face in the future to and effectively carry out our missions now and in the future. To achieve this objective, the power system has developed uh, an integrated human resource plan, we call it the IHRP, and that can be used as the building block, a foundation and a blueprint um, to guide us towards a positive uh, organizational change in the future, where we will be able to effectively align workload with workforce projections, where we would be able to identify skills critical skill set needs in staffing, assess achievement, progresses, and uh, 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 challenges as well throughout the transformation process, and harmonize and align our human resource needs with the budget process to meet our short-term and long-term goals. The IHRP is a framework. It is a beginning step that will be used as a roadmap to iteratively determine appropriate levels of staffing each year and to also identify the gap and close the gap between the present and present capacities and capabilities required to perform our job. To that end, presenting uh, today on this profoundly critical topic, 
uh, our uh, PJ Chua, the assistant director of uh, the Power Transmission Planning, Regulatory and uh, Innovation Division, and Dennis Obiak, who is LADWP's manager for transmission planning. PJ. Um, just just one quick second, um, Simon, before um, they start. You indicated this is a, um, a high-level overview of the pivot we would need to make moving forward. Um, I assume, Brian, based on what you said, this has not been, there's no budget aligned with what's being presented. This is simply the human resource power that we would need. Is that correct? Correct. That's okay, correct. and then the other piece of this is, um, you know what? I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I guess my I'm curious, um, given where we are today, if we were to implement this, uh, how far out would we be? I mean, like, how long would it take to make this pivot? Because obviously, if this is where we are today, we're not ready to move forward in this vein. Is so I'm just curious about that part. So specifically where we're at today, I mean, we're still moving forward with our plan for our, for our human resources at that point. So we are still moving forward in that direction as far as hiring and fulfilling our vacancies and, and those type of things. So I don't think the results of this is essentially making a big change on the direction that we're going, just where we need to be. Just where we need to be. Yeah. And there's a gap analysis? Okay, so okay. just in terms of closing the gap, um, is there a time horizon associated with that? Or is that, you know, if I, ultimately we've got to do, we've got to be in a position to right. perform, right? Right. <laughs> so at some point we have to not be seeking to arrive, we have to arrive. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious as to whether there's some analysis or understanding of that. And I, and I think there is, and it's it's mostly on how this particular human resource plan is going to tie in with our long-term resource plan and where our, where we need to be at that in, by 2035. The direction that we're going is still to move forward with this plan as it is as we're finalizing it. Okay. Um, uh, uh, if I may, yes. uh, Commission President, we will uh, go through a 10-year analysis that has been completed already. Uh, uh, depending on, based on uh, the uh, uh, large project projections that we have in the future, um, on the system needs that we have today. Um, so we'll go through all those, and I think this would be a good foundation for the bridge that we are you know, we're discussing earlier, which is uh, how do we make it happen? Uh, it's going to be the next step, but I think we have laid out all the, uh, the groundwork, if you will. Gotcha. Yes. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that framing. Thank you, as always, very helpful. I'm excited to hear from this team. You were so good last time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. PJ. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, in today's presentation, our agenda is to discuss the approach that was used in developing the IHI pre which was based on specific objectives as well as power systems strategic priorities. Following that, we are going to discuss the current state of the power system and the future state needed to support the power system goals and initiatives. And last but not the least, uh, we will also cover next steps. Next slide, please. Uh, as part of the approach, the first action we took was to create a steering committee where each power system division assigned one or two representatives to be the ambassadors for their respective division to help integrate the workload projections, identify the skills that are not only needed but also critical, and the workforce management activities. In addition, the steering committee members also helped develop recommendations to improve current process, identify opportunities and methodologies for recruiting, retaining, and developing highly skilled, diverse, technical workforce. Um, and also, we would need those workforce to have the capacity and agility to meet emerging needs and any fluctuations in our workload. 
So what you see in this slide are the IHRP objectives. Um, these were developed through numerous and continuous engagements with power system management as well as the steering committee members, uh, such that whatever we come up with in the IHRP, that it is actionable, that it solves real problems, and it also addresses current and future challenges that we have. So the ideal, to achieve the ideal staffing levels, there are six objectives, which are first, resolve existing planned work, resolving vacancies, but it's also important that we plan for retirement. Next is also identifying future human resource needs as well as identifying future critical skill sets. But all of this can only be achieved uh, by being supported by the budget process, which we refer to here as the um, financial sustainability plan. So as Simon mentioned before, the human resource planning should be in sync with the overall power system strategic priorities. First, the transition we are making in our energy resources will have a real impact on our human resource needs. Equally important is maintaining the reliability and the resiliency of the grid as we go through this transition, because our customers expect us to provide the same level of reliability and resiliency, if not better in the future. We also need to account for the advent of transportation and building, building electrification and the load growth that will come with that. There are also requirements to inject innovation in everything that we do. For example, it could be in the use of new technologies and digitizing the grid. Last but not least, as a key strategic priority, we are addressing equity in the service we provide to our customers. The IHRP will set the foundation to support all of these strategic priorities. I'll, I will now pass it on to Dennis Obiang to continue this discussion. Thank you, P. Joy. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, what you see here is some constraint that we have to be aware about as we uh, implement a plan. Budget support is important. As you know, when you, we're going to go through the numbers, you're going to see that we have a lot of staff need to meet the future need in, uh, that we're going to have for both load growth and also meeting, making sure that SLTFP is achievable. Adding staff increase the revenue requirement, we know that, which is the amount of money power need to raise to maintain and operate the system. One way to deal with it is to, to understand that we're going to capitalize some of those labor costs because a lot of the work we're going to do is capital intensive to reduce that burden. But at the same time, we're still left with the benefit that also when we hire new staff, that is the health benefit, pension that we have to take into consideration that add a little bit of pressure into our revenue requirement. We're working closely with FSO to ensure that when we develop the plan, we can see how realistic that plan would be and how do we get there. The second constraint has to do with the fact that we recognize, we looked into our historical performance, our hiring process has been slow. It could be fast, we sometimes it's fast, but most of the time in general is slow. As a result, it causes us to be less competitive when we go on campus for engineering side of the business. Uh, by the time we spot a talent, we kept him in a list for a few, many months, and by the time we go back to him, he's already gone. Those are the things we're trying to re relieve and say how do we reduce the timeline to bring people on board. The next one is what we call the limited hiring capacity. What is a hiring capacity? The amount, the quantity of staff we need to have to handle uh, processing of interview, processing of uh, application, making sure that the interview are on site. All of that infrastructure have to be revisited to ensure that we are successful to implement this plan we're going to share with you all. Last but not least, space. We can't just hire and not knowing where they're going to sit, so space is also equally important. Showing here is an amount of work that went on when we designed the, uh, the IHRP. As you heard from P. Joy, we start by defining the objective of power system. It's important we understand what that is. The objective of power system is telling us what is power system is trying to achieve. 
and how do we implement those goals and what are the human resources need to support those goals? That's step one. And then what we did there, we decentralized those objectives to various function, various division and power systems. We will share with you what it looks like. And then we asked our question, where are we today understanding the current state vacancies, a skill gap, and attrition for retirement? Where do we want to be, which the board president mentioned, the gap analysis, future state, where we're going to build a lot of system, new generation asset, what staff requirement is needed to support that jump from here to there. And then we have to make sure the plan is realistic. We have to ensure that we can afford it, working with FSO to continue running iterative analysis to see how we start developing a plan where we start hiring people today. This is truly a 10-year plan. You're going to see the staffing level required to support that transition that you, uh, T. Joy mentioned earlier about the various strategic objective of power system. One of them is energy transition, and the second most important is also load growth. We're going to describe the high level of what the human resource plan looks like. At the bottom of the curve, we show you a various interaction we have with many uh, stakeholders. It took us a year. I know it's too long, but it was a necessary time spent to ensure that we collect feedback from various SMEs, including our AGM directors that are representing various divisions. Um, and just while you're going to the next slide, I know we have human resources that sort of chain of command in the room. Um, I'm going to want to follow up with you after this presentation. I expect to see some intersection between what's being put forward by the department um, operating staff and what can be achieved um, by our human resources. I mean, we can't keep, I mean, they're saying this over and over, so I need human resources to be able to say, and Marty, I know that you've been dealing with personnel, that these um, constraints, um, and a number of them are being mentioned and will continue to be mentioned, can be addressed, and when they'll be addressed, and how they'll be addressed, so that this becomes achievable. Otherwise, we're just, you know, wasting air as we're talking about this stuff. Next slide. We had a significant amount of data that we use, power system, financial service, payroll, human resource. I'm not going to go to the detail, but a lot of data were analyzed to get to the point. I think what I want to ensure we understand about this plan, the plan is truly pretty much empirical. The idea was to tie human resource need with the project. So that if we say I need project A, we need to understand what it takes to develop project A. How many people will we need to develop project A? We will go through the sequencing of those projects shortly, understanding the breadth of work that is coming ahead of us. To help make sure that we dissect power system human resource need, we devise what we call four planning scenarios. The first scenario is called system intact. What it means is that what it takes to run power system today. We need to meet our regulatory requirement. We cannot defer on those. We need to ensure that we continue to reduce our backlog because we have a lot of backlog, meaning plan work that have not that have been deferred or maybe deprioritized. So we need to ensure that we resolve those. But it also we also need to make sure that we keep up with our aging infrastructure. Power system reliability program, which is a flagship program the power system have to ensure that we maintain our grid, we are going to also make sure that we develop the there are specific baseline that we need to achieve. And then system operation, making sure we operate the grid. So scenario one is truly system intact or keep the lights on. The next scenario is what we call power system reliability plus or PSRP plus. What does that mean? It means that we recognize that while we're doing a lot of work to improve our infrastructure, but we have to do a little bit more than that because we need to keep up with the aging infrastructure. And we have identified specific uh, infrastructure replacement target that we need to revamp over the next 10 years to keep up with that aging infrastructure. So we call scenario two PSRP plus. The third scenario is clear. This is a money making scenario. Load growth, the anticipated load growth as a result of electrification of building and, and transportation. And in here, we recognize that one approach to do that, to prepare for that eventual load growth with a lot of EV behind the meter resource, we can do a few things creatively, add new distribution station, 
and also maybe replace all the distribution stations that are aging and cost so much money to maintain with bigger distribution, distribution stations that can not only meet demand today, but also plan for extra capacity for that load growth. And also, we are also piloting what we call voltage conversion. How do we ensure that we ramp up the voltage level we have today, which is 4.8 kilovolt, to a higher voltage level that can enable us to bring more capacity into the distribution system, thereby increasing the penetration of EV charging. Last but not least, we call scenario four, which is long-term strategic resource plan and strategic transmission plan. That scenario addresses a big investment, major project, long transmission system, new corridor and transmission under the transmission side. And under the resource side, we talk about generation asset, battery storage, PPAs. Those are the bigger part of scenario four. And when you see here, all scenarios are incremental. Scenario one, system intact, has a value-based level of staff we need to have. Scenario two, PSRP plus, is an addition on top of scenario one. Scenario three is an addition on top of scenario two. And scenario four is an additional staffing level on top of scenario three. Now, let's talk about the current state of power system today before we understand the future state. First, what we did, I want to introduce you all to the various division of power system. We separated the division in two categories. The, dark, the top color, I think blue, are the division that are pretty much provide engineering and technical services. And the bottom sex the group are the division that provide construction, maintenance, and operation. We will use this color scheme going forward to kind of show the nuance between those two groups. And in general, each of those divisions is pretty much its own company. They do their own thing, very little nexus, and understanding how they operate, understanding what is the human resource need, understanding how the major strategic objective that we talked about earlier that power system has to fulfill, how does that get decentralized into those various divisions so that they get to carry their function? First, as you see the blue color, we're talking about engineering <laughs> and technical services. <laughs> what we've seen here is the total population in engineering uh, services division, the four, the five division that I showed early on top, what you we shown here the top 15 civil service classification that are used in this division, mostly engineers, electrical, mechanical, civil engineer, and manager in that field. And to your left, you see a lot of dots. What we're trying to show you, we're trying to understand the overlap of those civil service classification with the rest of the division. How often those civil service classification are used by those division? It gives us an understanding of how when we shape the human resource plan, we understand that the pipeline has to be bigger to satisfy all those divisions because they share similar civil service classification. The next group is the construction, maintenance, and operation side of power system. We have seen here the top 15 civil service classification. They represent over three quarter of power system, 3,900 staff compared to the previous group. And you can see less, they have less dots, meaning they are very little in common with the previous group. So that shows that their staffing need is pretty much coalescing around field work, technical field work, and we're going to show how we secure those. We talk about the pipeline of those field work to meet their various demand. Before you leave this slide, just um, I, I, I struggle because the, the columns, um, I know they're meaningful to you of all the different organizations, but uh, I, don't, I don't have my decoder ring on today to, to know which group is, is which. So I need your help in just understanding the uh, black is, is operations roughly and, and what is the light blue column? What is that, what does PSST stand for? Oh, very good. Uh, the, first of all, the green on top are all the division we share, but yes. the specific division that are part of construction and maintenance are basically PCM, power con construction and maintenance, and we have ISS, integrated service, and then we have power supply operation, that's the dark blue, and then to the left, the training safety division, okay. that's the last one. Okay, Those thanks. four columns are basically they share the same kind of staffing sometimes, but the last one in a PSRT, the one that train all of them, 
to make sure that they have the staff they need to get to the next stage. You can see the rest of the division are silent because they don't share much with them. Great, thank you. A little bit of a demographic to help understand this slide with the bottom represent the age group and the left one represent the years of service in color code. What you see here, the, the box at the bottom refer to basically the, the experienced worker, those that are pretty much going through eligible to retirement. And the darker the color, those are high experience. I just got thrown by all of the old at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My eye went to the 59, 60, but it just, I just saw old in a box. <laughs> we have the same problem over here. <laughs> but I see you're not really discriminating. It's just the way it laid out in your the, chart. The nature of the data. Everybody's old. <laughs> Yeah, just, I think, hypersensitive, that's all. Okay. <laughs> so this graph enabled us to understand when we're going to dive into retirement, where are the retirement will come from in the future? And also experience worker, how do we ensure that we do proper succession planning so that we get to ensure the new hiree get to work with the experience worker before they depart the company? Demographic. Here showing to you is the city of Los Angeles demographic compared to power system. Uh, you can see that power system is pretty much in line with the city of Los Angeles demographic. Can we do more? Yes, but so far we are pretty much representative of the community we serve. That's the point of this graph. So good job for us, but we will continue to do more in the future as well. Now with respect to gender, you can see the CEO of Los Angeles, 51% are women and 10% in power system only. Yes, we recognize that we have uh, very little female uh, because the tech, we have to ensure that we continue to bridge the gap. We, don't sh we are not showing this graph here to say we're going to go over it overnight, but we're trying to show that we do have a problem and we, will, we, we have a plan how to address that problem going forward. <clears throat> Vacancies. These are the power system vacancies by division. I'm not going to spend time going to all of them, but I'm going to highlight the top four. Now, the first major vacancy for the first division is PTND, power transmission and distribution. They have over 33% of the total vacancies. The second, under the construction and maintenance group, they have about 25% vacancies. That's under power, construction and maintenance side of power system. Now, what about the engineering side of power system? <laughs> My own division, power transmission, reliability, I mean, re regulatory innovation, we have about 27% vacancies. And next to us, we have also resource development plan that have about 21% vacancies. In general, across the board, we do have a lot of vacancies that we need to address, and that's going to be one of the plans. How do we address to fill those vacancies? I do recognize we do have technical challenge there. We're going to talk about it towards the presentation. So according to this, we have over 1,200 vacancies just on the, in the power system. On the power system. Out oh. of a population of 4829. 4829 we have, or 4829 is what we should have? No, 4829 is what we have. Okay. One quarter is so missing. So we're missing, yeah. well, we're missing 20%. Yeah, about. Oh. And, and just to clarify, how many, Last year, how many do we add? So some of those are more recent, but there are vacancies, but uh, we added what? These are the vacancies that have been reported to us by the various uh, utility administrator up to date. Okay. This is the total number. We confirm that, we double check, we double check, this is where we are today. But but go, just to reiterate, so I'm, on, I'm clear. So the total amount of position authorities is 4,800? No, no, no. The total bodies today sitting personnel-wise is 4,800. Now, we recognize that annual personal resolution, which means that I have the people here and that what we call budget position, and the additional positions that are not yet fulfilled, but they're still budgeted, that's an APR. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay. We just say if we do a body count today, 4,800. Those that are missing, 1,200. All of them budgeted position. Got it. If I could add one piece to that too, is when you when you look at the budgeted positions. So we also have all of our trainees and a training program sit in a substitute position. So when they graduate, they will fill those budgeted positions. 
So, so are you now just trying to confuse me? No, uh, essentially, if you look at, uh, for lack of a better term, just butts and seats that we have, the amount of people that we have here. So we have a, a whole group of apprentices that will graduate into those operator linemen, all those positions. So they'll take up that budgeted position. So, so we have a person here working that, right? They're just not sitting in that budgeted position. So if you look at it strictly from the numbers on how many budgeted positions that we have, how many that we have filled, you know, uh, we have, you know, 5,900 budgeted positions. We have 54 that are filled, um, or, or people that are here. So it doesn't quite correlate into exactly budgeted versus substitute positions. And how many apprentices do we have? So in each of the programs, I don't know the total offhand if you have it on one of the slides coming up here, um, but essentially uh, about 130 in our alignment program, um, another uh, 210, I believe, in our um, electrical mechanic program, um, only about 40 in our operator program. Uh, SPAs, I'm not sure offhand, Roughly but like 500 when, yeah, when you look at all of the programs together, probably about 600 people, yeah. So are you telling us that we're missing 600, not 1,200? Yes, well, they'll be filled, depending on how many graduate from each of the programs, is they will fill into those positions, yes. Okay, that sounds very different than <laughs> originally said 1,200 vacancies. Right. Um, I have a, okay, I have other questions, but I'll ask them later. Now, with respect to the vacancy, this is a category, the top 15 vacancy by civil service classification. The blue color represents the engineering technical side of power system, and the light green color represents the construction, operation, and maintenance of power system. These are just the top 15 that make up the 1205 that we see today, and by volume. So I have a question. Um, so, uh, Brian, the roughly 600 people that you say are in various programs, how would they distribute at, against between these two, the two sides of the house? So is it, because you said that we're not down 1,200, we're really down 600 because we've got another approximately 600 that technically don't belong to, that technically- They're not sitting in the budgeted position, correct? Right, they aren't technically in the budgeted position, but that are here doing work. So of that 600, is it even? Is it more in construction operation versus engineering? How does that? It's mostly in construction. There's that's about what a, I thought. A, just so, over 100. Right, um, so that, yeah. that's kind of what I thought. So, um, so while, because as we're nuancing this, where we are having the most significant impact as it relates to, uh, you know, the lack of uh, uh, horsepower in terms of our, 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 you know, folks who are on board and doing work is in the engineering technical uh, vacancies, right? Yes. Okay. And we will find out why we have a little bit of a challenge there when we go through the, the pipeline, what it takes to bring them in. Because you have to complete all of that work before the construction work happens, correct? correct. Exactly. So that creates a significant bottleneck if correct. we don't have that side of the house properly staffed. You, you got That's it. going to show up on the construction side, yes. right? Correct. correct. Okay. Retirement eligibility, we have to understand how the population that are retiring, the, the, the first box represent the critical uh, civil service classification that are uh, basically vulnerable for retirement by volume. And then the one in the middle represent the one that are eligible within the next three years and the last box within the next five years. So understanding eligibility give us an idea about the pool of the potential retirement so that we can take control of those retirement. Showing here is also what we call critical retirement eligibility. And as we mentioned earlier, here where the problems start to be clear, showing on the, the yellow box are basically supervisory management positions that are highly close to retirement. And one thing we noticed from the field side, the construction operation uh, maintenance side of power system, 
electric uh, service manager, uh, pretty much a lot of them are on the verge of retirement. But we also note that to go from, to have a supervisor, go from supervisor to management, there is not a lot of incentive for them to do so. That can cause a little bit of issue for us to feel, to develop the pipeline to replace those electric service management. So that is critical. Something we have to see, how do we bridge the gap to bring more leadership from the construction, maintenance operation into management position. And then talking about this, the civil service classification where the training takes a long time. We have, for example, electric station uh, uh, operator where it takes about 24 months and electric mechanic, it takes about 48 months and then uh, electric distribution mechanic 42 months. You can see that because they take a long time to train them, we, don't, we may not keep up with the need unless we have a bigger pool, uh, which we will talk about shortly. We have a bigger pool to start with so that we have a better graduation rate, and then they get to go into training and then successfully land into the work to do the work. So these are the challenges we face today. How do we ensure for those critical civil service classification that we develop the pipeline to replace those that are retiring and also that are those that are living voluntarily? We will talk about that shortly. This is what we call the projection for retirement. Shown here to the left is of the left of the graph is historical data to the right projection. To the left, you see the retirement and power system happen in waves. So you see the wave, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. It's a reflection of how we hire our people. We hire our people in group that tend to coalesce and then retire together. So that's what it is. To the right is a projection. What we found out from this analysis is that we are exiting a wave of retirement, not entering one. That gives us a little bit of flexibility to ensure that we develop most of our human resource to go to this project. You see the moderate level of retirement descending and then picking up around 2031 at the level of 2008. So we do have a break here. That means we have a better control of those retirement as opposed to 2013, 2014, we have what we call mass exodus. It was in 100, 200 relieving at once, and we have to plan for all of those retirement. So that's the retirement projection. The story here, we need to plan for those regardless, even though the moderate amount. Now, introducing a new topic called separation and accession. What does it mean? Separation means that those that are leaving the department due to attrition, attrition, retirement, and volunteer departure, accession, how many people we hire to fill those departure. Contrasting those two graphs is an important piece of this analysis. What we did here, we just highlight where we're struggling the most. That's not a representation of power system, overall power system is doing well. Let's take a look at those curves. The bottom curve is a light green representing a session. How many people we recruited over the last five years? The top curve representing separation, meaning retirement and volunteer departure. You see the curve on top exceed the curve at the bottom. We want the reverse to be true. We want the curve at the bottom be on top and the one on top be at the bottom. This is only true for specific service oil classification. I'm talking about electric distribution mechanic electric station operator, load dispatcher, some civil engineer, steam plant assistant. When you coalesce those groups, the curves look like this. But when you take the rest of power system civil service classification, this is only seven groups out of 140, the curve is inverted. So we just highlighted that these are the civil service classification we need to worry about. To your right, we show you an example of what it looks like. You see electric, uh, the first one, electric distribution mechanic, the dark green exceed the light green. We want the curve to look like uh, electric, uh, electric engineer associate where the lighter green exceed the darker green. That's the story here. So we're keeping an eye on those specific civil service classification. And you understand by now, it is also tied to the pipeline the training, how long it takes to train them. That's what the gap is about. We can't keep up with replacing them because it takes a little longer to train. What we need to do there, bigger pool, so we have a bigger volume so they fulfill those, close that gap. Now, a quick summary, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, thinking, I mean, this report is being put forward by the power system, um, all of which rolls up Marty, you know, Brian through y'all. 
Um, I'm just, I mean, is this a report that the doc, I mean, I assume you've seen it <laughs> and that the department is standing behind this and that we are going to put in place because the analysis is quite useful. Um, and it sort of just <clears throat> lays out the blueprint for what mm -hmm. we have to do if we're going to address these issues. So I'm just curious as to, at the leadership level, what um, is being thought through, because again, a lot of this is gonna roll back to HR and to personnel um, in order to get on top of and ahead of this. And it's particularly useful to look at um, you know, to sort of shrink the the the, uh, the scope down to the specific areas where we are falling behind as it relates to the um, separation and ascension curve. So I'm just curious because often it feels like we're all in the same state of discovery. Well. Uh, you know, Powers pioneered this level of detail, and we've we've done a lot of look in the past of, you know, in general how many retirements and things to expect. Um, looking at, you know, slicing the information in this way, and looking specifically where the jobs reside and where there's competition between civil service classes. Um, this is a the the most detailed look we've had at that. And then uh, there's also interestingly because a lot of these classes are also shared by water, and so there is not only the competition between. Uh, power divisions for some of the same people, but also potentially with uh, with water, and then sometimes joint, depending on the classifications. And so, um, you know, the next step will be to to see how we look at this on a broader company scale, because it is the same issue, and there well, are overlapping right now, issues on that. Because I, so, I guess right now, what I'm interested in is how we address the issues that as they are being put forward by power, only because they've done the heavy lift. I mean, you would expect, I would expect. Um, HR to have this kind of detailed analysis about what's happening and to be pushing forward with this kind of lift. And I get that it needs to be done department-wide, but again, we're trying to fast track LA 100. <laughs> That's on the backs of power. And they've already done the work. So I'm just curious as to how we begin to integrate HR into this process so that they can begin to, you know, adapt what needs to be adapted and move forward. Because all the power system can do is identify the issues. Right. They can't solve them. <laughs> they can just tell them what they are. Um, they can give us recommendations, but we have a whole nother part of the department that's over hiring and recruitment and all of that good stuff. Um, and I expect that they are the ones that are gonna come forward with an operationalized solution to these issues. I do know that that labor, that there's some com continual com continuing conversations with our labor partners around training um, and also even around how certain classifications move within the department. I'm thinking of the, um, some of the engineering classifications because mm -hmm. some of that is a little disruptive to operations. Um, and I wanna see that addressed as well. Otherwise, again, we'll keep talking at a high level, but we're not going to operationalize anything that's going to make a difference. Right. And one of the things that Brian, uh, he let him comment, but of the 600, 500, 600 people that are trainees, um, one of the challenges, hopefully, what percent of those materialize into full-time employees, and and that's some changes we have made is to be able to uh, access what we think are candidates that are more likely to be successful in that process. Because that is that you know we're bringing with X number of people that'll become permanent job takers. Unfortunately, the history tells us they won't all get there, and that's a serious gap in terms of getting to where we need to be in the future. And I don't want to comment. Well, no, right. which is why I suspect that it's correct for them not to be counted as bodies here because they're not actually until we know, that, until until they we make know it. their bodies here. That's right. one. But the other thing I do want to be, you know, clear about is when Brian brought forward the nuance around the trainees, that that nuance is so is mostly associated with. Um, field, not the um, internal, not not the engineering, not the engineering, engineering staff, and there are a host of issues around engineering staff that 
we're still a long way away from, or if not a long way away from, that need to be focused, need focused attention right now. Um, because the further we fall behind, or the more overwhelmed we are in that space, you know, that is a barrier that we can't, we can't get past as it relates to what we're going to actually you know, build and do. They've got to, they're, they're the tip of the spear. Right, and I think if you look at the, the slide on the right side of this slide, um, if you look at the engineering associate, the electrical engineering associate, where we have done a massive amount of hiring um, and where we continue. So we've, we've hired three classes this last year. Uh, we have another class coming out of 30 people on November 7th. Um, so we, we are bridging that gap, right? And it's a short two year stint where they're in sub positions before they roll into those budgeted positions. And the same here with the electrical craft helper, which is so, the feeder to all the construction no, side. I, I, that part, that's great. And so we'll talk about that because I do want to begin to narrow right. the conversation to the areas that actually need to be operationally dealt with. Um, I also am going to want to have a discussion, perhaps not in this meeting, but offline, um, that deals more directly with rotations, because it's not just getting them here, but it's what they're working on and how those assignments are happening. And again, I know that's a conversation that also involves I, um, IBW, but we've got to have that conversation too, because if the way that they are being rotated impacts the specific, you know, work that needs, the progress of the work that needs to get done, then, you know, that is a constraint that we've got to deal with. And Marty, we talked about space previously and you told me that wasn't an issue and I told you I hear about it all the time. So we're gonna need to also address the space issue because if you don't think we have space constraints and people in our department do, and they've done a general survey, and that's one of the things that comes up, space, then we need to create some alignment between what you know and what everybody else knows so that we are not thinking that we have constraints now or in the future as it relates to space. No, we, we definitely have constraints. So I think what I'd said is it hadn't stopped us yet from hiring, but it will. And so uh, there we're doing, but yeah, I mean, so I, I do agree we have constraints. It's not a, not a question there. Okay, well, then we need to understand how we're going to address the constraints so that people know that we'll be able to move forward without difficulty. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. No, no, this is a great discussion. I think the people, the staff are listening live because this is important to them. Uh, we've talked to all the division. We're looking at 48 employees. This is something that means a lot to them. One thing I want to mention, Madam Board President, is that although we are presenting the highlight of the findings, each division has its own report prescription that say how we're going to get there. What are the issues they face? How are we going to solve it? This is not just a mere exercise. We want to develop an actionable plan. So the report will be synthesized <laughs> to form the integrated human resource plan for power executive to implement. And today we're gonna to talk about the highlight of some of the key solution to really make sure we move forward the hiring. Before I go to the future state, just to recap what we learned from prison, current state, we need to fill the vacancies, we know that. We need to address gender gap, we know that. We have a plan, we need to plan for retirement, it's coming. And also we need to plan for critical position, which we talked about. A quick recap before we go to the future state about the four planning scenario we're gonna dive into. The first one, system intact, reduction of backlog. The second one, PSRP plus, revamping uh, power system reliability program to ensure we keep up with aging infrastructure. The third one, which in my mind is a money-making scenario, we need to anticipate load growth and build the infrastructure around it. The last one, major project, transmission and, 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 and also generation asset we need to add to meet SLTRP and also load growth. With that, let's go to the future state. This is a summary of what it takes to get to the first stage. Basically, what would it take today to ensure that we run a power system effectively, efficiently, by reducing the amount of backlog that is out there? The total staffing level year over year, starting in fiscal year 2023, is about 115 growing for totaling 1,154 new staff. This is what is required just to ensure that we catch up with the backlog and we keep that system intact running. 
The good news with this level of staffing is that it also set the foundation for all the rest of the initiative. We talk about load growth. We talk about you know energy transition, grid reliability. So that start by sure ensuring that we staff the, the, the various division to perform the level of work they need to do today just to keep the lights on. Scenario one, this is a total 1,154. Now, before we talk about scenario two, I want to highlight an example of the why we want to revamp specific replacement program for those infrastructure. Just an example. We have a 48, 4.8 feeder miles. For example, today we 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 replacing 10 miles per 10 miles a year. As you can see, we do marginal increment of 15, 15, and growing all the way to 20 miles between 27 and 28. That will get us to a level where we can catch up with the aging infrastructure. But to do that, it takes human resources. As I mentioned, this plan is tying human resource need with the project. So I'm not going to go through the entire list. These are the specific infrastructure replacement target that if we revamp them, it will put us in a good position to start addressing the major problem, which is load growth. With that in mind, this is the total body that is needed. For this scenario, we need additional 539 bodies. Now, adding from the previous scenario, 1,154, the grand total is 1,604. These two scenarios need a separate introduction, load growth and power system uh, strategic resource plan and strategic transmission plan. Showing here, I know it's a little bit a lot going on. <laughs> okay, I've got it. I'm... Just take it easy. We will get through this. <laughs> you know what? It is uh, almost noon, um, and I do want to stick with you, and I know we will get through this, but um, I just want to check in with folks to determine if a break. How much longer is your presentation? This is the last scenario, and then it's over. Oh, okay. We'll stay then. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to very, very quickly. I think no, no, the, don't, don't hurry. Okay. I didn't want you to hurry through it. The scenario, what you see here, the project that are coming on in a pipeline to meet load growth and to make sure that SLTRP is achievable. You're not aware of that this is what's coming. The first part, we separate the project based on the category of power system function. The first one, transmission. The second one, distribution station. So the, I just have a quick question. Sure. If you back up to the first two pieces that you went through, is that, um, does, do, does system one and the, so it says baseline yes. and operation and maintenance, is that assuming that we're just running the system as is? Is that what, that's what you're saying? So that's yes. just to running keep doing what we're doing. Yes. Okay, I just want to, you know, be clear about that. And that also addresses the backlog that we have currently. No, no, so I yeah. get that. So this is, this is yeah. what we have to do to just catch up. Right. Yes. And, and Brian's <laughs> right. So, you know, we, we had, we've been fighting a backlog <laughs> generated 20 years ago, as well as with the reliability program, improving reliability. And so that's, this is. This is our ongoing baseline right. work just right. to keep it, up it, with it what we're doing. It's to get us to where we should be. Right. Exactly. Right. To get us to where we should be. And I'm just, I have a question, Dr. Pickle, for you because I know that you've been engaged in a lot of this work and a lot of these discussions and you've reviewed some, perhaps not all, and I don't know to what level of detail you've looked at what's being presented today. But as it relates to just getting to slides 20, 26 and 20, 26, <laughs> um, is that, does that comport with what your understanding of sort of where we are, what the work is and, you know, does this make sense to you, I guess, is my question. There's a critical piece missing. Yes. And that is uh, the joint system provides a lot of help to both water and power in this. And the joint system, if you remember back to the budgets where joint system was budgeted in, their headcount was very similar, one year more, but now less uh, than the power system. And that's where the IT support that's associated with a lot of this comes from. That's where the customer service, that's where a lot of the meter connection um, and, uh, and related issues uh, are worked on. So we need to mirror this 
on the joint system side. So what you're basically saying is that while you don't take issue with what power system is presenting no. relative to what they need to do, but you are also pointing to the fact that this is sitting on top of an infrastructure mm -hmm. that's we, we, provided we, by joint system mm -hmm. and that that has to be up to speed mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. or that becomes another mm -hmm. trigger point for and, failure. And both you and Marty have pointed out we need to do the whole organization. But we're unfortunately, we're flying in this airplane uh, and we need to... <laughs> upgrade it as we go, um, the backlogs are big. Uh, and it's really important to work down those backlogs, but we may not have the ability to wait on some of the other things like electric vehicles. We have an obligation to serve. If that moves more quickly than we anticipate, uh, we're gonna be scrambling to do upgrades because of service problems. Uh, as people install home chargers and they weigh down various distribution systems. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, all right, so then go to the next slide, just because, again, I want to, I do words better than pictures, so I get confused by this pictures. This one is just to help you understand that we have more, we have identified additional projects that are in the pipeline to make those things real. The scenarios three and four yes. um, are related to the work that we are embarking on taking on yes. in addition to the baseline work. Yes. Okay. And Dennis, each of these lines is an actual discrete project, right? Exactly. Each of those lines, a specific project, a starting point, ending point. Look at the yellow line, 2035. You see some of them crossing by designs because we don't need them to be really ending there because we're also planning for load growth with the infliction point 2030, 2032, so we can cross that further, 2045. So that's what you see here. One thing I want to address, I know we're out of time, is that before we talk about the transmission project, you know, the board has been inquiring about the status of the existing project. We have about 34 projects in transmission today, overhead, underground, station equipment. They're not all transmission projects in terms of line themselves, but they're related. So as a project man to transmit manager of transmission planning, I want to assure the board that those projects are in play for 2030, 2029. With the caveat, there are risks. The equipment can get delayed because we couldn't deliver it. As an example, we have a story where the, 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 the equipment fell on the bottom of the sea because the wind condition, it delayed the project. I'm just telling you, it these really are happened, realities, yes. <laughs> okay? So we it's also terrible. have a problem, a thing that we need to coordinate among our staff, de-energizing the line so that staff get to work on it. We call it outage window. Mm -hmm. Energy Control Center is the one that grant that permission to go work on the line. And they only grant them during non-summer month. So we have a very tiny window to work with. So if they grant us, we do the work. The point of the story here is that there are risks, like any other project, there are risks. As a matter of fact, we have a senior manager who conduct regular meetings with all the project managers assigned to those 34 projects to determine what are those risks, what are the status, where we are. But we are moving forward with those projects. Showing here is on top of those 34 projects to carry us all the way to 2035, 2045. That so, is so just to be clear, though, the, the projects that you are talking about, those are the projects that are essential to, again, maintaining our current level of service and reliability, right? Those are the projects that are, that they're part of that baseline work that we are doing always all the time. That's cool. And also some of those projects are also part of SLTRP to get ready for the 2035. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying here that as we look into the long-term view, strategic transmission plan, we have identified additional need because of load growth that is coming and these are what those projects are. The next board meeting, we're gonna dive into those, 30, those additional projects in detail. Okay. So I'm gonna skip now, I'm gonna go to the scenario three and four just to give you what we're working on. Scenario three, three, which is load growth, we add additional 1,072. Great investment because we are revamping the distribution system. We have creative way to do it. We're gonna maybe replace it all distribution system, build a bigger distribution system, not only to serve current load level, but also future load level. It brings the grand total 2765. Scenario four, which is big project, Look at the number we're adding, only 248, because we have assuming that 
based on historical performance, we normally have contractors build those big projects, battery storage, for example, new transmission corridor. We're only going to need staff to do interconnection, to plug those projects into our system, but also staff to manage those projects. So the number is exactly a little low. If we were to say we're going to divert from historical performance where we normally hire a contractor and we want to do it ourselves, these numbers will go up. So this is what we have so far, 3,100. Um, 3,011, 3, so that's what it would take us to get to the finish line. This is truly a 10-year plan, year over year, and also ensure that we inject the staff at the right moment to ensure that they get to do the job. This is just a summary. I'm not going to waste your time here showing everything we talk about. We need to keep up with retirement. We need to fill the vacancy, all the staffing for future state, all the way to 3,000. I'm going to pass it on to next step. Okay, now that you know the current state, um, so what are the next steps that uh, we need to take and consider? As you've seen in Dennis's presentation, majority of our vacancies are in the construction operation and maintenance divisions. So we have some uh, process improvements uh, that we'd like to recommend and for you to consider. Um, so as you know, maintaining a high quality candidate pool is critical in bringing the talent needed to perform the tasks that we need to do now and in the future. So since we're on an innovative train, we have to do things not business as usual. So we have to look at some of those processes. So one of the things is um, we need to work with city personnel in structuring some of those civil service exams to be open only. Uh, I apologize for the typo on this slide where it says uh, open slash promotional. Uh, the recommendation is open exams only. And what that allows us to do is to have new talent to come in so that everyone that is eligible could apply. Uh, in addition, for certain critical classifications, we need to have the flexibility to administer the, the exams either continuously or allow for a larger pool of applicants to take those so exams. So are we working on these two issues now? I mean, we've... Yeah. Yes. yes, we've actually... Um, have we made got progress? A, a couple <laughs> classes that were critical are already gone to open only. There's a couple that we are working through we're now working with on. personnel where they didn't agree and we're trying to get them to that point to go open only. So we are making progress in that. And we have, we've got that already in the beginning of the electrical series, which is critical for electrical craft helpers coming in. Okay, so um, I guess I'll be interested, would be interested in a, just a written report okay. that gives us a status on our discussions with city personnel so that we know where we're at. Yeah. That provides, you know, what we're trying to get to open only and you know, what we've achieved. Um, in addition, um, the yeah. flexibility in service rule 4.2, uh, is that is that a challenge to achieve? Um, I think it's more of a, of a manpower issue with personnel. Michael, do you want to address the issue with that real quickly? And, and again, real, real quick, so again, on the, on the open only thing, so we are getting applicants. What we're trying to do is make sure that some of the classifications are open to, to people who have a larger chance of being successful, particularly because we have a lot of exempt people who come to work in the electrical field from the union hall who are very well qualified, know our workplace, would love to become permanent employees. And, and historically, they've been kind of had to wait for everybody else to clear the list before they could be reachable. And we know they probably have a higher propensity for being successful here. So that's what going open gets us. It's not more candidates, but it's a probably a candidate pool that's more likely to be successful. And then those trainees become full-time employees. Right. Right. And it's also targeting the people that we're recruiting. So we right. go to recruiting events and we, we gather them up and essentially if they don't get the opportunity. No, I, I, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. They can't get. Right. So we're trying to we never get past the promotional gap. list. <laughs> yeah. Am I going to address a 4.2 issue? Sure. Okay, um, and we talked to Dana and everybody about this. Right. So uh, civil service rule 4.2 is something that, that uh, the, the personnel department, department enacted several years ago. In essence, it's something that allows them to, to put a certain number of people on a civil service eligible list that corresponds roughly to the number of vacancies that a hiring department has said they will need as opposed to, depending on what the exam is, 
examining day after day after day for 10,000 applicants. Um, so that's when, and they decide when they apply 4.2. So I, I just have a quick question about this. Um, a, I know that we have our, we you know pay for and have our own cadre of city attorneys, right. um, and we've discussed the potential of paying for and having our own cadre of folks and personnel uh, to just do our work right. um, that would be separate and apart from whatever's happening at the city. Um, in the same way that people are able to focus our attention on. Um, adjusting bureaucratic um, constraints to our um, to you know what they're trying to achieve by tying the thing that we're trying to the thing that they want us to address to an actual outcome that's important to us right so like the housing advocates homelessness and addressing homelessness is important it focuses the mind when you start to look at your own practices in a way that says oh this is interfering with our ability to achieve this policy objective. I think we have just got to start to cause the bureaucracy around the city, and in particular personnel, to understand that if we can't address these kinds of practices, we can't achieve the policy objective, the overarching policy objective that's been laid out for us. So um, I'm just very interested in this being addressed again with some level of urgency because it is urgent. Right. And well, otherwise- We have stressed, <laughs> we have stressed to, to personnel that uh, 4.2, while we understand why it exists, and in some in some instances it may well be appropriate. Then perhaps, um, Marty, I know that we've discussed this as, again as well, and so perhaps we need to come up with more creative ways of making this clear. I mean, there's city, you know, council committees that deal with these issues. There are other avenues to affect how personnel behaves, but we do have to start to make it plain that you know, addressing X, Y, or Z, whatever it is, or the failure to address that will have specific consequences. And I, I do I, believe that that will better focus attention on these issues and get them off the back burner or off the, even if it's not back burner, just sort of the regular bureaucratic train that these things are on. And because we can't wait another three, six, you know, nine months, and I just, I, we can't be talking about this again in a year. We've got to have this over, done, complete, and be moving forward. And I agree with our, our president, and you said, you know, we need to, we can't do business as usual. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? I mean, do uh, the commissioners need to go to justify in front of personnel committee and city council and say it's urgent? I mean, what we need to do something. I mean, I really appreciate the presentation today because I love the fact that we're looking 10 years out because most of the city doesn't do that. And so what the good news, I have the detail. The bad news, I, we're, more people are leaving than coming in and we have more work. And so that's a problem. Obviously, we, everybody can see that. So. However, we can be helpful. I mean, this is, to me, a urgent situation that we all need to work together and not have business as usual and really push whatever we need, whoever we need to push to get this done. Because I know the bureaucracy can weigh us down and we can't let that happen. Yeah, if I can just say, we have expressed to personnel the issues with 4.2. Sometimes when they enact 4.2, even if it's an open only exam, um, and there are enough candidates in the city departments to meet the anticipated vacancies, they may not actually let any open candidates apply. Now that happened with MCH up in the Owens Valley and we complained bitterly, they gave a second administration. So I an guess moving the power forward, system. what I will say about this, and I think we can sort of put an end to this conversation, is Robert, Marty, I will be looking, uh, I'm, uh, Commissioner, um, uh, uh, gosh, what is going on with my head? 
Um, in any event, I will be moving. I will be looking forward to this coming to a. Um, I want to call Commissioner Ruiz Reyes. <laughs> it's like two ERs. It's either the ERs or the two But in any event, uh, we serve on the Workforce um, Ad Hoc Committee, mm -hmm. so we will be looking forward to a conversation with the two of you regarding a strategy to accelerate progress on these issues. I understand, uh, Michael, that you've had conversation with staff. Um, but this absolutely has to not be just elevated, you know, every now and then, but it needs to stay elevated because this is not the kind of thing that's going to get resolved with the level of urgency that we need it addressed if it remains a conversation with staff. So, um, Ms. President, if I could just say, we, we recently put in a request for two power system exams to become open only as opposed to open and promotional. We got 50% of what we asked for. They agreed to make EDM open only. I think that was easy. And we're for pushing, that. and we're pushing back on the other. But you're right. There's not a there's not a wholesale across the board yeah, fix. We, and it's yeah, point, it's and point by point. I mean, we can't keep suggesting that our workforce is going to produce, you know, something equivalent to, um, you know, a a miracle as it relates to the transformation of this systems that we're asking them to, if we're not willing to, you know, just take on the bureaucracy that's getting in their way in a way that's much more effective than we have been able to. I mean, we've made progress, but we can make more. So we just need to push much harder and much further up the hill. And is there any way to maybe partner with other proprietaries with the airport and the port and we come together and we say, we want a special unit within the personnel department to handle our situation? I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I think uh, outside the box. You for yeah. Analysts over there, although we're a very large percentage of the testing and the hiring that they do. I don't we're, know what We're is. about mid 40% of all of their examining duties. And, and, and Vice President, we do have a uh, small staff that's dedicated. Uh, we fund them. And uh, we have four professional staff and three clerical. They do But, only but that's probably examining. just getting through the regular, not getting right. through where we need to be. Right. That's examining. We also have a smaller staff in the classification division. They work with us on creating so new classes. So in the same way that I think that what um, uh, Dr. Pickle indicated earlier, and this is an example of that, that in order for uh, us to achieve our objectives, we can't just look at power system. We've got to look at the department as an integrated operation. And so in the same way that power system is putting forward a plan that supports innovation and a radical alteration of how they operate. Um, we've got to look at other places in the department where we need innovation and a radical change in how we are operating. And we've dealt with person, I think we've heard about HR constraints ad nauseum. Um, so at this juncture, um, I, we are pretty committed to uh, looking at how this dynamic is impacted in a way that supports the work that our um, employees, you know, need to get done. Um, and, Commissioner Amy Brady. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to reiterate my support for this work. I, I, three years ago, this, we had this conversation and it feels like uh, all the progress has been marginal. So I think your point about radical um, change is, is really necessary at this point. So um, I appreciate the subcommittee taking this on and happy to support in any way. I just wanna add that toward the end of this presentation, we do have a role and responsibility, including the board member assistant. We're gonna talk about it pretty soon. Carry on. Okay, next slide, please. So building on the previous slide, um, as you know, DWP uh, is not an island. We need to work with the other uh, city agencies because majority of our distribution work, for example, are on city streets. So what could we do? Uh, we need to collaborate more with the other city agencies so that we have access to our work areas for a longer period of time. We also need to maximize our training capacity and identify facilities uh, where training can be conducted throughout the city. Uh, so what are we really trying to do here? 
uh, by collaborating with other city agencies um, where we could possibly build flexibility in the moratorium on the streets, then we can provide all of our trainees more opportunity to work on a variety of projects and thus building that efficiency and also the experience that we need here. So in doing so, it would allow us to complete those projects faster. Next slide. For our engineers and technical staff, we also need to train them and also build expertise. It is crucial to have a division specific onboarding program but beyond that, we need to have a systematic way of implementing those training plans. They cannot just be training plans where they get assigned ad hoc work. We need to be able to have those engineers progress their jobs just like what we have now with emerging technologies or the new uh, priorities that the power system must have. So this would ensure that we have the consistency, but also be able to accomplish the competency needed in order to complete those projects. So Dennis will discuss in the next slide the policy considerations. Very, very quickly, I think what we notice in terms of hiring that we need to update that civil service classification. Some of them are 50 year old. We need to take the term to make sure they reflect current practice. That's what we notice. Uh, in training, we need to ensure that we revise the training requirement, create an, a standard coherent training across the board. Uh, so that staff understand what to expect. And in terms of retention, we talked about it earlier, one of the critical position, elective service manager. How do we incent them to the lower staff to go into those positions to incentive would be needed? And lastly, career development. PJO talked about, you know, ensure that we provide career development in terms of training, mentoring uh, for staff. They need mentoring specifically. And now that we're going through this transformation, support from other peer engineer and good succession planning where the experienced worker before they depart to retirement, they get to leave some knowledge transfer with the team. Branding, branding is important. I speak from experience. When I went to on campus interview, two people show up and I said, that's not possible. We called the university and talked to all the professors. We gathered the team and we spoke to the staff. The next day, major crowd. We need to tell the world who is DWP. We can brand it through the work we do, a job of the future. So branding is important. In the interest of time, I'm gonna now let Simon Zudu to talk about the roles and responsibilities. Before you do that, just really quickly, um, could you go back to the uh, previous slide to this one? Uh, amend civil service job descriptions. I know this is like so in the weeds, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> I also do know that everything springs from that. Yes. Um, again, this seems to be something that's been on the plate, you know, sort of for a bit, like yeah. across, the de yeah. across the department. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for this? And when can this be, I mean, who's responsible for this? Because we just have to well, start, so people have to be the, accountable the work goes and we have to, to get H stuff done. The, the work goes to HR, um, usually it's brought to them by the user divisions. Um, one of the things that we've had, so the, because we have common classes throughout the city, it's difficult. And one of the things we found to be successful is when we able to create new water and power specific classes where we can control the job description so it doesn't interfere with what, because there are jobs that have the same, same title as other people in the city, but the actual work is very different. And so that's been one we've been successful. Uh, Tree I Surgeon just, was one of I those. I just think we have to have a strategy for getting this complete and we have to have a date by which it's going to be done. Um, because, you know, we are just, we are crashing on, you know, over, you know, on, on our own weight, the weight of, of 400 job classifications and all of these antiquated civil service definitions and on and on and on and on. There has got to be a way to streamline this. Just, it's, this is what we're gonna do. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's how companies act. You identify a problem, you put somebody in charge of, of overseeing, it's, you know, you identify the, the solution, you put somebody in charge of overseeing the execution of it, they have a date by which that's going to be complete, they track it, I mean, that's how you build projects. And people here do, that's how everybody else works. So I just think that we have to have a whole lot more accountability in the joint system with respect to this kind of definitional stuff. And it just needs to get finished. 
So I will be interested, um, you know, on a report back on how this is getting done. Who's Do accountable for it, by when, what the strategy is. Do we have this level of detail on the water side? Sorry, turn on the microphone. Um, <laughs> for the water system, we don't have the exact same process. We, we use um, resource loaded schedules for our all capital program. So all the capital programs have detailed schedules that show also the resource required. We then con we put all those together then and we figure out then what our resources needs are. Now, I would say that uh, when it comes on the operational maintenance side, that's where we are trying to improve the process that we do have. I, I think what I've seen today, I think this is excellent work by the way, and uh, it would make sense for us to have a similar approach. And I think I've heard it before, talked about doing it for the entire department, because we are also a customer of the power system. Right. You know, so when you talk about PCM, for example, and the work that the electrical and general construction folks do, they support a lot of the work that we do. So I think it will be of benefit to basically use the same system so that we can all be looking at it from the same exact perspective. Specifically, when it comes to Operation Next, which is basically our biggest program, yeah. right. we have looked at that. We have some preliminary numbers, but we're working on a master plan that's going to further identify the needs that we have not just from the construction perspective, but long-term operations and maintenance, and especially the fact that we got classifications that require extensive training, like our treatment operators. And there's gonna be new, new requirements for wastewater, advanced treated wastewater treatment operators, and we're gonna to have to incorporate that into our workforce as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, yeah. the specific process is when operating divisions feel that a job description, I think the class specification is what we mean, if it's outdated and it needs to be updated, they'll come to HR and we'll work with the classification division at the personnel department. They revise that class class specification and it's approved by the Civil Service Commission. Yeah, I think, for, as I said, sometime, I think what we're gonna need is we're going to need, which is why I don't expect you to outline it for me now, is we're going to need some thinking around strategically what we need to accomplish as opposed to ad hoc case by case incremental steps toward a de a dealing with this issue. What we know is we have our, our current civil service job descriptions are not in line with today's workforce needs and requirements. Mm -hmm. And we have known that for a long time. It's not, you know, this isn't a small issue, it's a big issue. So we need to sit down as an agency and whoever is responsible for this needs to back up, look at how we're going to address this issue in a, in a timely way um, and in a way that doesn't take it on the way we've been taking it on, in a way that will create the change we need, that will support the recruitment and hiring of the workforce that we need to do the work that we have to get done. And, you know, that's just, you know, we're transitioning. The, the kind of work we talk about here as it relates to water and power and the provision of those services and what we're taking on with respect to Operation Next and what we're taking on with respect to LA 100, I, I think to the presenter's point is remarkable. It is the kind of work that we should be bragging about everywhere and we do whenever we get the chance. It requires, it is a great selling point in terms of recruiting staff, et cetera. We've got to match that level of ambition, expertise, and performance as it relates to the other operating units within this department. And HR and personnel is one of these, it's a supportive unit. It's got to it's got to think about the moonshot that it needs to achieve with respect to revolutionizing the way in which the department is performing certain um, activities within the confines of municipal government. And we can do that, but we have to think about it differently. And this is just, an, we just, so I don't wanna know how it's done. I've heard it a bunch of times. I know how it's done. I wanna know what, is going to need to be done and how you plan to both streamline, update, and implement 
the changes that we need to support the work that they're doing within a time frame that aligns with what they need. So we are water and power, but we're nothing without the people. And this is the people piece. And if we don't have the people, you know, we're not going to succeed. Okay. Simon, last slide. We keep slide. interrupting you. No, no, no <laughs> this, this, these are pretty long. Slides. <laughs> More slides. It's okay. Okay. Um, in addition to all these uh, policy considerations, uh, as part of the plan, we are uh, providing an overarching recommendations on roles and responsibilities for the major stakeholders within the department. Uh, the first one would be our uh, board of commissioners uh, for advocacy for um, you know any positive change that we can make in the city codes, our internal processes, and uh, overseeing that we have a streamlined uh, we streamline and accelerate our hiring process. I think that would help us a lot. And uh, through the approval of the staffing levels on a yearly basis through the budgetary process, that would be uh, a, a very important step in getting us to where we need to be. Uh, second would be uh, responsibility for uh, the power system executive office, uh, developing uh, key performance indicators to oversee and monitor uh, progress, uh, identify challenges, establish metrics, and uh, uh, reporting those uh, accordingly to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Board of Commissioners, and uh, act as a sponsor for all the implementation strategies for the nine divisions within Power System. Uh, last but not least, uh, the financial service organizations. We talked about the four scenarios today, very critical and incremental in nature, uh, integrating the IHRP's core scenarios that we discussed today into the budget process so that power system can achieve its goals. What's not mentioned here in the assumption is the Human Resources Department will be working with all these three major stakeholders inherently to make sure that we need, uh, will meet our goals. Next slide. So uh, how does it all come together? Uh, how do we uh, stitch this fabric at the end of the day? Um, uh, Brian Wilbur earlier, um, I think, talked about the major power system initiatives and uh, he talked about how the initiatives build on each other and ag are aggregated at the end. Uh, here we are depicting the same process uh, at a more granular level from a, a standpoint of a human resources uh, planning. So as you can see on the left side of the screen, the scenarios we analyzed today and we discussed, uh, system impact, PSRP+, plus, load growth, SLTRP, strategic transmission plan, are all incrementally, uh, uh, you know, contributing towards the, our human resources needs in power system. Decisions on these uh, uh, factors are woven into the HR plan that we uh, need to update on a yearly basis. And these decisions need to be made iteratively on a yearly basis uh, with the understanding that the projects and the programs that will come out of these pro uh, scenarios will be evaluated under the equity strategies lens to ensure that the implementation as well as the distribution of these projects is equitable to all Angelinos. I think that's uh, the core mission of the equity strategies and that's how we can bring it all together and through the budget process we can actually aggregate everything and plan ahead on a yearly basis. Uh, uh, this is the vision we have on uh, contribution of IHRP uh, and how it can be integrated into the big picture. And uh, with that, uh, we will conclude our presentation and we'll be very happy to entertain your questions. Are there any questions uh, or additional comments? Yeah, I think we've all, certainly I've spoken enough. I will simply say that um, it is clear that this presentation represents the culmination of a great deal of work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, both the uh, management team and certainly, uh, you know, on behalf of the board, I want to tell you how grateful we are for the work, how proud we are um, that you're capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, this just uh, speaks volumes to the uh, quality and capacity of the uh, employees at this department. We've seen the best of this department represented today, uh, beginning with the, uh, you know, uh, celebration 
uh, for the accomplishments at the Lyman's Rodeo and, you know, and, you know, uh, continuing with the work that uh, was put forward by your team. So thank you for that. I can simply uh, add that we all really at the senior levels of this organization have to prove ourselves worthy um, of, the, uh, uh, of the trust and confidence of the many men and women who come to work here every day and make uh, this operation what it is. So thank you, and uh, you did not disappoint either of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Great report. Uh, Dr. Pickle, did you have anything to add about the uh, scenarios three or four presentation or information that was provided? Um, I think that was good, that was important, and uh, uh, looking at the numbers, uh, they were starting to think about some of the things I was worrying about uh, in the early years. Uh, so I, I like, it was a very impressive piece of work. We need to do it more broadly. And the only additional comment is, I'm an optimist, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> um, there's a need for a contingency plan in this process. Uh, if we, ha if and when we have a recession, the city's revenues contract more slowly than DWP's revenues contract. And that means uh, the rest of the city will be in a state where you got to cut back, we're cutting back, you got to cut back too or that typically is a time in the utility industry where you can hire when others are firing. Uh, and so that's an important time to get the skilled workers in the right spots that you might not otherwise be able to get. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we're going to take a brief break before the next presentation. Uh, so uh, can we be back in uh, 10 minutes. Does that work? All right. Uh, so we'll recess until 1140. Thanks. 40. I'm sorry, 1240. <laughs> and I'm wearing my glasses. <laughs> Remember the Mike Shalai show. Mike Shalai.
Please maintain silence until the meeting reconvenes. Please maintain silence until the meeting reconvenes. I've been out of town. I missed it. No. Okay. Thank you. Madam President, we are recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Board Secretary, would you please take the roll? Commissioner Lerere? Who's here? President McLean Hill? Uh, present. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Present. Vice President Ruiz? Present. Four board members and a quorum is present? Okay, perfect. So this is a power system all day today. <laughs> uh, we have a report on wildfire mitigation. Ooh. Brian, go ahead. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, once again, so every year we're required we, we come to the board yeah, with an update. It's, it's to record that it. time yes. again. Yes, so <laughs> it is that time again for our mitigation update, um, our wildfire mitigation update. Um, so I'd like to bring uh, forward uh, David Hansen. Um, who's our assistant director for uh, power transmission distribution, and Scott Hiroshima, um, who works with uh, under in Simon's group under Transmission Planning Regulatory and Innovation Division. Good morning, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Special thinking is okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, as was mentioned, this is to present our annual updates uh, for 2022 of LEDDP's wildfire mitigation plan. Uh, the graphics shown here uh, represent the wildfire trends across the state of California uh, over the past six years. Um, what's interesting to note is, uh, although there was a decrease in the acres burned by these wildfires this past year so far, uh, the number of wildfires has been very consistent with the five-year average. Um, so we're still seeing a, a continued uh, increased risk of wildfires, uh, really primarily driven by uh, climate change and the uh, drought conditions we're experiencing. Um, so since 2018, when Senate Bill 901 was first passed, re requiring us to have a wildfire mitigation plan, there's been a lot of uh, collaboration between LEDAP and some of our uh, external entities, such as California Municipal Utilities Association, and the Southern California Public Powers Authority, um, CMUA and SCAPA. And so we have regular participation in a lot of the, their working groups, uh, specifically the regulatory working group and wildfire working groups. And that's really led to a lot of uh, communication back and forth, sharing of ideas, and it really helped us to um, uh, address the, the, the recommendations from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board collectively uh, and have a consistent approach to our wildfire mitigation plan. 
Uh, most recently, in May of this past year, we participated in a workshop on unanticipated risk where industry and utility experts came together to really discuss um, unanticipated wildfire risk. And so there's a lot of good discussion on how we assess uh, risk, how we plan for risk, uh, some of the communication that occurs back and forth between utilities uh, when risks actually occur. Um, so that was a very productive discussion uh, in May of this past year. <clears throat> and now moving on to the, the actual um, feedback we received from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board. Um, uh, they released their advisory opinion document on our 2021 wildfire mitigation plan in March of this past year. And uh, just so happened that la just last week, uh, they released their draft advisory opinion on the 2022 update. Um, so, you know, while we didn't get to include those specific updates here, uh, I can definitely provide some uh, details on that feedback. Uh, just uh, to note that the 2022 revision to the wildfire mitigation plan was an incremental update. Uh, and so as such, the recommendations and uh, feedback from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board was very consistent from 2021 to 2022. And just noting, you know, some of the things that they expressed appreciation and accommodation on uh, within our wildfire mitigation plan. Uh, in terms of uh, the information we provided, we provided additional context setting information uh, and really uh, information to help them tailor their review, focus their review of our plan. So they're appreciative of that. Uh, they also commended us on some of the specific uh, mitigation practices we employ. So namely uh, our vegetation management program some of the specific practices that we employ uh, for vegetation management. Uh, they also uh, were very appreciative of the asset information that we provide, you know, talking about the number of poles within our system, uh, transformers, cross arms, uh, and conductor mileage. So that as, as long or as well as the associated replacement um, metrics, uh, they were very appreciative of, of that information. Uh, in addition, um, at, at least new for 2022, uh, they, they actually commended us on a lot of our um, approaches to new wildfire mitigation practices. So, you know, uh, installing new cover conductor in our system as well as how we evaluate uh, new technology uh, that's gonna make it towards uh, uh, improve our well, wildfire mitigation practices. And moving on to the, the actual recommendations from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board, uh, these are the general kind of categorizations of their recommendations, not specific to LEDDP, but more general to the entire public beyond utility uh, entities. Um, and so, you know, just going down the list here, plan structure, uh, this was something that they, uh, they actually updated in, in the draft uh, recommendations last week. They would like us to follow a new template uh, for all publicly owned utilities moving forward. Uh, and that's something we're, we're definitely gonna evaluate very closely and see how we can implement. Up the, this, this board? The Wildfire Safety Advisory Board is comprised of um, wildfire experts um, appointed, uh, I believe, by, by the governor. Appointed by the governor. Okay, so there's, are there utility representatives? There are representatives with utility experience, I believe. Utility but experience. No, no utility representatives, you know, current, current utility representatives. Okay. So they're meant to be and, an independent the, board. Oh, go ahead, sorry. They're meant to be an independent board to really uh, guide and review wildfire mitigation plans and activities of utilities, both investor-owned utilities and publicly-owned utilities. And who funds the work that this uh, they're, they're producing here, the guidance? In terms of the actual wildfire mitigation plan? The, their recommendations. So they put together these recommendations. Um, who's funding? Somebody has to be paid to do work, right? So who puts, who is funding that work? How is that funded? Uh, for the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board, I believe that's uh, state funding. State funding? Mm -hmm. With the CPUC. Through the CPUC? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then, so some of the, the feedback aside from that, um, actually some of the specific feedback we received uh, from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board uh, was in the area of community uh, communication. Uh, so in 2021, they actually recommended that we expand upon the uh, community outreach and public awareness uh, section in our plan. So that's something we, we really looked at closely uh, and provided additional detail uh, in the 2022 update in terms of you know, how we disseminate information about the wildfire mitigation plan to the public. And in their draft uh, opinion released last week, uh, they commended us on that addition, on the expanded detail 
uh, really directly addressing their, their recommendation. Uh, and some of the other areas that they continue to focus on are uh, grid hardening, uh, risk assessment, and vegetation management. I will point out uh, one new recommendation that they um, identified in their draft uh, opinion last week uh, was to expand upon our, our performance metric of our plan. It's really you know, identifying how well the plan is performing. So that's something we're going to evaluate um, for the next revision. And I will pass it off to Dave. Thank you. So these four categories, uh, power system reliability program, operations and protocol, I and M, and then uh, what are we doing for community outreach and public awareness as part of our wildfire plan? Next slide. Uh, so our PSRP targets, uh, this is our actuals performed. Uh, you can see fiscal year 18, 19, 19, 20, and 20, and 21. You can see that uh, these numbers are increasing over the years. And they are uh, our PSRP uh, replacements that are happening in our tier one and tier two uh, high fire threat zones. Uh, what's going to be new moving forward is that we have a wildfire contract. So that contract is there to augment with contract crews some of the work that we're already doing in these high fire uh, tier two and tier three areas. Uh, next slide. So for operations and protocols, uh, we notify our neighboring uh, utilities anytime we have transmission outages that we feel may affect them. Uh, we pick up the phone and make those phone calls so they can be informed as soon as possible. We also inform the Office of Emergency Management if we have more than 10,000 customers out. And of course, we block our reclosures in our tier three areas uh, when there's a fire threat. Uh, for inspection and maintenance, uh, GO 165 requires a detailed inspection every five years, and we're doing it in every three. So we are exceeding that requirement for INM. And then as far as our community outreach and public awareness, uh, presentations such as this uh, at the board meeting. Uh, we also have our website, ladwp.com uh, forward slash wildfire plan, as well as uh, ladwpeasternsierra.com. Uh, we allow for public comment at this, uh, also through our email address, uh, wmp at ladwp.com. Uh, neighborhood council meetings, we provide updates and presentations as requested, and then we also make this information available through LADWP News, and we communicate with Joe Romalo's group on that. All right, uh, and so what are our next steps? So at least for the 2022 wildfire mitigation plan, that was submitted to the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board in June of this past year. Um, and additional requirements uh, require us to update that plan every three years comprehensively, uh, with the in-between years being incremental updates. Uh, and so 2023 will in fact be a comprehensive update. Um, and so what, what exactly are we gonna look at updating? Um, we wanna focus on situational awareness, you know, looking at the data, the technology that we use to be informed of wildfire conditions and inform decisions um, to, in response to those conditions. Uh, we also wanna look, look at uh, closely at performance metrics. So, you know, this was a recommendation directly from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board, but we, we had already been planning to see what can we, what can we look at uh, to measure the performance of the plan and how does that inform future changes to our plan. Uh, we also wanna continue our, our focus on customer awareness and communication. I think that's a very important aspect of the plan. Uh, and then inspection and maintenance, as Dave, Dave had just mentioned, uh, we've reduced our inspection um, intervals, so increased inspections essentially. And we wanna give that the proper weight within our, within our mitigation plan. And then once all those updates are complete, uh, we will be contracting with an independent evaluator to assess the overall comprehensiveness of the wildfire mitigation plan. Uh, and all of that we expect to complete by July of next year, and we will be back to present those updates to this board. And so with that, uh, I'd like to welcome any questions. So I do have a question because obviously public awareness is important. However, so it's specifically letting the public know that we have a wildfire or mitigation plan. Is that, is that, are we asking the public to do anything or we just want them to let them know that we have a plan? I think a lot of it is just the fact that we have a plan and, and what we're doing to adjust wildfire mitigation. So just you know, putting that, that plan out there uh, so that pe people are aware of, of our actions uh, to mitigate wildfires as a result of you know, our, our infrastructure. Okay. Uh, and we do provide you know, the ability for them to um, provide public comment uh, via email. Um, 
And so we have received, you know, uh, several emails in the past uh, from, from the public. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions, but do want to commend the department on um, the quality of the plan that it's put forward and the successful, continued successful mitigation in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and I don't know that we <laughs> express that enough. So when we get that feedback from the Wildfire Safety Advisory Board, um, the fact that we did so well this year really shows how much work got put into the plan um, this year. And uh, next year is going to be a big change. And we'll have a very detailed report on that, on the changes that go into the plan um, before we submit again by next July. We well, appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we're just uh, very fortunate not to uh, be overly um, at risk, although, uh, you know, there is within our service area, obviously, risk and certainly within uh, the corridors that we operate. Um, so this is very important. And it's, again, a testament to the uh, to the efforts uh, on the part of uh, the folks who work here that just in doing your job, it's being done in such an exemplary fashion that people take note. Mm -hmm. So appreciate that. Yeah, and I think a big piece on what you were asking essentially on the public outreach is how different we are from how a lot of people are doing their wildfire mitigation, um, specifically the PSPS, the safety shutoffs um, that a lot of the utilities do that, that we don't do here. We're really uh, banking on the fact of our PSRP program um, is rebuilding our system in those fire areas and to where they are very reliable and very safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think next up are filed items. Uh, are there any questions or comments about any of the filed items? Nope. Then we'll move to approval of the minutes. So uh, moved. A second. Would you please call the roll? Commissioner Mayor? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner Newman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Four ayes, motion adopted. Thank you so very much. Uh, we will go to the items then that were called special, beginning with item L1. Uh, Commissioner uh, Neiman Brady, that was an item that you asked for. Would Just you like a presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Deidre Fernandes, Director of Labor Relations. Um, as uh, Commissioner Ruiz said, we have water, we have power, and then we have the people piece. This is the people piece. <laughs> this um, item before you is a memorandum of understanding with IBW Local 18 that represents 10 bargaining units for the period of September, excuse me, October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2025 is a four year contract. It provides for annual cost of living, um, October of each year with a CPI based, a floor of 2.5 to 5.5%. It also addresses some critical classes. Um, it's focused on recruitment and training and retention. There are some critical classes for electric distribution mechanic and for electric mechanic that provides for some special adjustments. It also addresses um, a retirement plan, savings complement to our retirement plan, and uh, training premiums and another of a uh, number of other details. I can go into specifics or address any questions that you have. I was hoping you could uh, go through the presentation, please. Okay, so this contract does require um, Charter Section 219 City Council approval. And again, it provides for a annual CPI movement 2.5 as a floor to a ceiling of 5.5% every October of each year. Also provides a one-time inflation offset of 3% of the annual salary effective December 1st. 
we do, as I said, some special adjustments for electric distribution mechanic. It provides a 15% increase in addition to the COLA this year, and then a 5% next year. In 2024 and 2025, it provides a movement of, uh, of a calculation that's anywhere between one and 8% would be the cap. It provides this board the ability to look at some of the increases of some of our um, partners or in our in SMUD and PG&E and Southern California Edison to see what their movement is and to try to match that again with a cap of 8%. It is, requires um, EERC recommendation and then, um, but this board actually has that flexibility to make that movement. Um, it does a increase for electrical mechanic. It's 4.5 in addition to the COLA this year. And next year, additional 4.5 in 23, 24 and 25. Contract. So, so one of the things that I was struggling with in looking at this is, is it's hard to know what's additive and what's sequential. Uh, I, I kind of lost you in the in in if you <laughs> go back. Um, there seems to be a general cost of living adjustment, which is yes. somewhere between two and a half and five and a half percent. Yes. And then there are things that are outside of that. But for instance, on this slide the electrical mechanical increase in wage of four and a half percent um that is on top of the cola yes so the annual cola is for all 10 bargaining units again with the floor of 2.5 a ceiling of 5.5 but in addition to that it has a special adjustment for electrical mechanic um, and also the electric distribution mechanic to address kind of the critical classes and the retention and recruitment um, aspect that we have. So it's on top of that. Okay, and this one is annual at four and a half percent. The other one was one time at 15%, um, but then an additional 5% thereafter? Yes, for percent elect electric distribution mechanic, in addition to the COLA this year, they will get another movement of 15%. Right. Next year, a movement of 5% additional mm -hmm. to the annual COLA. And then in 24 and 25, there will be movement based on this board's recommendation with a cap of 8% that again requires the EERC to kind of see what that analysis is. But that is in addition to the COLA. Can I explain real quick? Yeah, real I was going to say so, it might be helpful because yeah. we can all read. So, so yeah. um, so, I think, yes, yeah, pro so providing the context for this particular um, uh, manifestation yeah. or so, you. You know, so, the bargaining context and how we arrived here and what's addressing and et cetera would be helpful. So, you know, as we've talked before, we've been falling behind in competing for electrical, distribu electrical distribution mechanics. And also we realize that electrical mechanic, which is not the folks who are on the poles, and, but they're the folks that are building the DS stations and setting uh, transformers and heavy equipment on the ground, um, we're also out of sync with the industry. Um, just so you know, I mean, in this world, unfortunately, everything ends up being a percent, which confuses the issue a little bit. Um, when we first presented, we were looking at you know trying to get an equivalent hourly dollar rate that that put us so we were competitive with other agencies like us. And so it happens to be that this is a percentage that it fell out fell out to be, but it, it was a marked movement from what we pay hourly now to something that was competitive based on looking at other agencies. Um, certainly, um, contractors pay differently because they have kind of different structure. Some of the IOUs pay a little different, differently. Um, they have some living expenses and sometimes that they cover. But this is similar in money uh, at uh, Edison and SMUD, who's so similar to us, to what they pay to retain uh, uh, the folks in this in this range. And so it's a one-time increase, particularly to take the line series, one-time increase to get to something that's comparable now it's an, another 5% addition next year because we believe that'll continue to keep us comparable. Originally, we looked at doing a set amount that years after that, but we really don't know what that amount should be. Right now, pg e is kind of acquiring all the line people in California and from out of state because of all their wildfire work. And so they keep raising the bar. So we don't know three years out and four years out what that bar will look like. If they change their program, there may not be 
that continued growth in salaries. If they continue the program, we may have to pay more to compete. But what we fought for was this board to have the authority, rather than going through the entire process, have this authority with a check in with the ERC based on comparing to these other agencies what we should pay in those years. We felt comfortable with the 15 and the five, but we felt this board needed flexibility after that to remain competitive. Okay, and, and just to clarify something that you're saying, because this is to remain competitive, so this is against, as you said, uh, PG&E and others. Um, is it such that PG&E, for instance, might be just um, working with their unit uh, of that of the union and negotiating? much more favorable terms? Is that what's happening? I mean, it, it's been that way throughout the industry. I mean, you know, people would leave us to go to Edison, then they leave Edison to go to a contractor who's working for Edison, and uh, talking to the Edison folks a couple weeks ago, uh, it's, it's the same story. And until we build workforce, honestly, until we build enough workforce in California, um, this will just be dog eat dog until people outpay each other. And that's one of the challenges. And I've talked to other agencies, I said, we need to work together because for us to develop you know, line crews and, and personnel, especially because we have a very high, highly rated and respected training program. So our people are very desirable. Right. And so if, as we develop people, then we're feeding everyone. And so we need to do this collectively as an industry. And we've been talking about how we work that together instead of everybody doing their own thing because it's not going to get us anywhere. This problem will not go away. And I, I think yeah. that the critical thing uh, to be understood here is the, the bargaining process. Um, which produced the MOU that's before us mm -hmm. is one that has been going on for about a year um, and included both management, labor, um, with some assist or with some, not assist, but with some um, baseline um, information um, and salary, uh, frankly, setting uh, or setting um, uh, context provided by the uh, rate pair advocates office um, to arrive at what uh, seemed to be a uh, solution that was both fair and one that the department uh, could afford and that the city would support <laughs> in connection with um, uh, the salaries that are being put forward. But I think you're, you're right, Marty, once it's all translated into the bureaucratic speak that yeah. is the MOU and the yeah. this and the that, it doesn't, it's hard it's to contextualize it. Yeah. I think yeah. the critical, one of the critical um, uh, differences or enhancements to this particular MOU is it does provide the board with some flexibility to assist in keeping up with the um, potential uh, compensation uh, needs that the department might have as it tries to remain competitive in its recruitment and retention. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, the fact that we set salaries via these MOUs does, uh, you know, put us in a position where we're kind of frozen in place for the duration, yeah. um, which is how we got so far behind, um, among other things. Uh, so uh, I think that's where we're at. Yeah, and you're correct. I think, and, and given the board that flexibility is the first time we've, I think anyone in the city's ever tried to, to try to unfreeze that situation. So, it, and um, I think that'll that'll help us as we move forward. Uh, I will tell you that the salaries we have that these equate to are competitive. Um, uh, I know that anecdotally we've gotten a few calls already from people interested in potentially coming back to the department, so that's a good <laughs> sign. Um, and uh, but it, you know, only time will tell what these jobs pay in the future, and so we're just trying to make sure we're able to address that without having to do a complete restart. Okay, um, I, I'm uh, pretty good. Uh, just two really quick questions. One um, is uh, so it's ret whenever we approve it, it becomes retroactive to the first. Well, it will come retroactive to October 1st. So it has to go from this board to the city council to approve, and then 30 days after that, but retro to October 1st, yes. Right. Yeah, and that was the end date of the last contract. So it just picks up where that right. left off. And uh, where do we stand with the management? Uh, right now, it's actually something... scheduled for um, city council for Friday. So uh, this board approved it two weeks ago. Now it goes to city council and uh, implement it 30 days after that. After yeah, it was waived out of committee, but scheduled for council, yeah. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Uh, any additional questions relative to this item? Move approval. Second. Commissioner Larere? Yes. President McLean Hill? Uh, yes. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Yes. Four ayes, motion adopted. Thank you. Thank you. I know Nicole did it right. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next item, thank you, is uh, item L2, uh, called special by uh, uh, VP Ruiz. So uh, let me just start off by saying is that, first of all, I love the fact that we are partnering, so MOUs are always uh, important, and I am supportive. However, I just wanted a little bit more detail, and um, anytime I look at a MOU or a contract, I always look, what are the deliverables and how do we know that it's working? So the, those kind of details is what I'm looking for, but I do support the item. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Mateau. I am the Assistant General Manager of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I'm also the Deputy Chief of that office. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Good afternoon, Board, President McLean Hill, staff, and community. Uh, this is my first meeting, so it's a pleasure to be here today to present. I'm also joined by Michael D'Andrea, our Director of Human Resources, as well as Ms. Erica Hill our manager of employment services, and I'd be remiss not to acknowledge my, my partner in the office, Mr. Andrew Kwok. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's the dynamic to to, duo. duo, right? <laughs> <laughs> pleasure to be here today to speak on this item. Uh, a little background about our office, the Office of DEI. Um, it was created last year in 2021, and as we've heard, the conversations today have centered around workforce development, they've centered around equity, they've centered around human resources, they, they've centered around labor relations. So the emphasis is on planning for the future, being strategic and delivering measurables for the future. The item before us today that we're recommending is an MOU that is going to address those items also through the lens of equity. That MOU is a partnership between the Los Angeles Unified School District as well as the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. You can advance the next slide, please. I wanted to give some background about the priority for our office and for our agency in terms of equity. Um, in the Office of DEI, we have a continuous focus on workforce development, envisioning the future. Uh, one of the tenets and one of the areas of focus in our office has been equity in terms of how do we engage with the community? How do we create that pop pipeline, if you will, for our future employers? Is it going to represent the diversity of our community, our organization, and meet the needs operationally? We feel this MOU does that. This MOU is basically a school to workplace pipeline that's going to create a pathway for students by the age of 16 to 20 to have exposure and access to our organization. They're gonna receive classroom training, they're gonna receive mentoring, they're gonna receive exposure that they would otherwise would receive. It's a relationship that encompasses nine high schools, nine high schools throughout the city um, that represents a cross section of the city, downtown, Los Angeles, East LA, the San Fernando Valley, and South LA. All nine of these high schools have a work experience program, and so they were selected based on that criteria as well as the proximity to our workplace here in LADWP. A little bit about the, the terms of the MOU and then I'll talk about the background of the program and then Michael and Erica will talk about the deliverables based on the funding of staff as well as how we're gonna measure success. In the Office of DEI, we place well, a lot of- All you had to do is tell me it's a pipeline and I'll, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, didn't, I, I didn't get I'm that. I'm intrigued now, so you can just keep going. <laughs> I'll, I'll get the administrative stuff out the way. The terms of the MOU. Um, the terms of the MOU is based on a one-year agreement between uh, LADWP and LA Unified. It's from the period of September 2022, which is already passed. Obviously, it's October, but we can adjust the dates upon approval of the MOU. But the MOU is based from the term of October 2022 to run through August 2023. LADWP and the MOU will have an option to extend year to year for two additional years, if so, uh, agreed to. The requested funding contained in the MOU will contain the administrative cost for the funding not to exceed 100,000 a year. The overall cost of the program will not be 300, will not to exceed a maximum of $300 for a three-year term. 
100,000? Yes. Okay. Or 300. Or $300. <laughs> That's yeah. part of the administrative costs. A little bit of the background of the YSA program. The Youth Services Academy is, is what it's known as. The program is designed to improve the readiness of young people for employment, including careers with the City of Los Angeles and LADWP. Essentially, it can be used as a school to workplace pathway. This program was established in 1990, so it's been around for a while. The most recent uh, agreement we've had with LAUSD and LADWP was from 2017 to 2020. It was suspended as of COVID. So this is the restart, the, if you will, the restart of this MOU. We're excited about that. Um, during that time of its inception, since 1990, 3,000 students have received access to this program. 3,000 students have received training, education, and uh, jo the job experience as part of the program. Next slide. The students that are selected in the program are actually going to be known as workers. They're going to be known as YSA workers. They're going to be employees of the department. Okay, how is this going to work with their school schedule and the work schedule? All right, we, we, we have a plan. These are going to be students that have been identified by the school district that have an interest to coming to explore this opportunity to learn about LADWP. They will continue their studies for half a day, the second half of the day, several days a week. They will come to our site. They will be mentored. They will be lined up with uh, employees who will oversee their development, who will train them in the civil service process, give them exposure to applications, filling out the job request card, as well as receiving a better understanding about applications, recruitment to civil service, and in, spe in, in specific, the job classifications that they're going to be receiving uh, exposure to. Typically, we expect about 50 students per year. This continues throughout the school year. We also have an additional program that's going to continue during the summer. So there will be overlap throughout the school year as well as in the summer for the, for the students. In regards to community engagement and the collaboration by our office, the outreach is a central component to this program. On a personal note, uh, I've spent about two decades of my career as a professional educator. Uh, some of that was at the high school level as a teacher and a principal. I've seen firsthand what these types of programs can do to our students, especially in the disadvantaged and underserved areas. So I recommend this program. Uh, I think it's going to be a great success. I'm glad to see that we're resuming it, and I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Erica. Thanks, Robert. Robert did a great job of presenting the MOU and the program to you. I just want to say uh, we are all really excited to bring this program back after a two-year hiatus. Um, it was typical for all of us to see LAUSD students in the hallways and in the uh, and in the in the offices learning and working, um, and we're really excited to bring that back. Uh, I think the best thing I can do is introduce two people to you to answer your questions. The first is Erica Hill. She's our manager of employment services. Erica and her staff have been working very hard over the past almost almost a year with their counterparts at LAUSD, restructuring this program, working with our legal team, their legal team, to put this MOU together. <coughs> so she can certainly answer questions on deliverables. We also have Mr. Tom Patsloff in the back of the room. Tom um, can answer your questions on the uh, summer youth program component. Uh, Tom is one of our most passionate uh, and enthusiastic champions of this program, and he oversaw a small group of students in the Fleet Services Division, and we're hoping that that will be a model for us to extend what has typically been an office internship program into the field at Power and Water at DWP. So I just want to say, initially, I didn't get all that from reading the MOU, so I'm glad I called this special because I think this program is amazing. So um, you said we're in nine high schools, so my question is, how do we expand that? I mean, you know, we have a, a people problem in the sense that we don't have enough people. We have a lot of residents out there in the city of Los Angeles. The young people are our future, so I would like to you know, expand this in, in the future because I think it's so needed in, on so many levels. So I'm really excited about the program. So thank you for presenting it. And I didn't mean well, to cut you off. Is there anything you'd like to say? 
Because I could see you smiling because this is your baby, well, isn't but it? I, have, yeah. I, have, I actually have questions. <laughs> so um, if we provided, if 3,000 kids have gone through the program, do we have any data on how many of those young people have actually become either city or department employees? So actually, commissioners, the last survey we did was in 2017, and we just, with LAUSD, we surveyed um, students that gone through the program back to 2011. So it was about 200 and something because we had, um, we would have 30 students at that time each year. Um, only about 49 responded, and there was only one that was a city employee. Um, but we need to do what our plan is. Yeah, because I'm, I'm very curious about, I mean, you had other questions when you, right. when you yeah. pulled this out. And so right. I'm very curious about not just results. Yeah, the yeah. thing that we're doing, but, you know, how are we doing it? And, and are we doing it in a way that's actually achieving outcomes that we want to achieve? So what our plan is going forward is to um, keep in better contact with the students and we do have all the information of all of the students that have participated in the program back to the 90s since we are paying them. So we have their, we did pay them when they're in the program. So we have their information. So we'll be um, well, doing except more. That going back into the 90s, I mean. I'm sorry, <laughs> what I mean is to get a clear um, understanding of how many are actually city employees today. So not just a five year look back, but actually the program in total. I know, but if you're telling me that a five year look back got you one city employee, then I guess my question would be, how did that inform um, the design of what you're presenting today? So the 200 that were polled, only 49 responded. Of the 49 responded, one was a city employee. It doesn't mean that the other, the remaining numbers are not city employees. They just did not respond. No, no, I understand. But when you start talking about data-based, you know, or data and evidence-based work, then, you know, there, there are several components of that. Some, you know, what is your, what is your data? And what does that data tell you? And so, among the things that you're now, what you're, what you're saying to us right now is that we didn't do a very good job of collecting data, so we don't have a lot. Right. So we don't have a lot of evidence to support that whatever we just did or whatever we did over the last 10 years actually resulted in the results that we were looking for. We don't know. And I, mean, I can accept that. Um, however, I, I so, but that does then ask, does then for me beg the question: What are we planning to do? How are we planning to do it to resolve the issue of, you know, data and and proof that this is an effective means of achieving our objective, um, you know? And then I'm just curious about because. We always have so many different things going on at the department. So the, there's this program, which you know I have no issue with and could be amazing. But then I do know that our different affinity groups are working with you know schools and are involved in sort of similar kinds of efforts. Are they engaged in this? I mean, are we cross-pollinating in a way that we are maximizing um, our efforts? Um, you know, so that you know, we don't have a little bit going everywhere. And I'm super interested in understanding the work that was done at Fleet Services. I, I have a lot of, I think that offers a, a lot of promise and opportunity. And then the final thing I'll say is that as I look at this, if I'm you know, 16 to even a 20 year old, um, I'm not gonna get too excited about getting schooled on civil service exams, because <laughs> I just, um, but, um, you know, I am going to get super excited about concrete work opportunities, which is why the fleet piece was just sort of jumped out at me. Um, because if I'm kind of inclined in that area, um, and I think about all of the work and all of the opportunities, and I've met a lot of people in that division, um, you know, that is then going to translate into me trying to figure out how I get to do that. So, so, so those are the kinds of things that kind of come to mind as I'm looking at this and, and hearing this presentation. Right, right. Commissioners, um, one of the things that's important is 
one of the things we saw in, in the survey is that I think of 42 people who responded, 36 indicated they had gone on to either community college or the university, which is fantastic, of course. We work really hard to inform them about a variety of opportunities at DWP, not just the office they happen to be working in. And now, of course, we've expanded from the office to the field. And so our hope is, and we're gonna start tracking this in a way that we clearly did not in the past, uh, our hope is that as they go on and they get experience and they get a, a degree, they look to come back to us because we teach them what a great employer we can be in so many different types of work. I, I would love for Tom to come up at some point here. because oh, he's, he's, he's right behind <laughs> yeah, he's you. He's broken waiting. Sh broken shoulder but, but, and I, all. But, I, but I will, but again, I, and I do want to underscore this. We have other department efforts and groups and even resources being directed at recruiting the very people right. that you are talking about. Right. So this begins to make sense to me if all of those things are being leveraged together. Well, it doesn't to make any sense to me if we're spending, you know, 100, right. 300,000 over here, a few, you know, million over there. That right. well, to, your, to your point, one of the things we're going to make sure is that all of our YSA and senior, uh, summer youth program students are aware of our introduction to electricity course at LA Trade Tech, which is available to everybody. And it qualifies uh, people with a, a certificate of completion for six power system entry level and skill And that they're being, when we're looking for mentors, we're looking into mentors sort of are being provided. mentored by right. folks a, in our affinity groups already who are exactly. looking for people to mentor and so that we can keep track of and you know better maximize again our efforts sure to your point of communicating with the students and finding out what they're doing i think i think tom can talk a little bit about the class that we had in 19 and 20. all right uh, good afternoon uh, commissioners uh, thank you michael um i'm actually very excited this program is coming back this is something that uh we started in fleet services working with the hr group ago um, I had gone to LAUSD and, and taken a look at what they're doing with their auto shop program in particular and saw the uh, the amount of work that they're putting in the enthusiasm in the kids and I said, what can I do with this group so I approached the uh, folks over the YSA group and said can we do this in the fleet shops and they said yes and so in the summer of 2019 we brought in five students um, and had them work with our mechanics our technicians in the shop Part of that working together was we uh, gave them uh, tours of the other facilities. Uh, we gave them education on how to apply for city jobs. You know, these city jobs, as we all know, are a big secret. And so our goal with our program, one, is to expose them to DWP, not just in fleet, but for us to become a destination. That's really my goal. You know, For them to come back and work for us, they're gonna have to do certain things. They have to graduate high school. They have to go to probably trade school, Pierce, uh, LA Trade Tech, whatever that is, and then come back. And so one of the questions that you guys had, what kind of feedback are we getting? Well, the fall class we had of 2019 coming into the spring of 2020, there were five students. Of them, three of them were young females. And I wanted to bring them here and introduce them to you guys. And unfortunately, COVID shut it down. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> we had gotten them uniforms. They were working in the shop with our I mean, they, they, I mean, they were part of the crew. This, it was a fantastic thing to see. And it was a very well uh, running program. It was very successful and it was heartbreaking to see it end. And I think I, I talked about this when I did the fleet presentation. Uh, just to give you a, an update, I'm part of the LA uh, USD advisory committee and last Thursday we did a ribbon cutting over at Pierce Community College. Pierce just opened up a new auto shop training facility that's going to focus on the new technologies that are coming out. And for us, that's the kind of technicians we need with the transformation to electric vehicles, fuel cell technology coming in. That is an educational facility that's going to be a feeder class for us. So I happened to run into the teacher from Van Nuys High School that had provided the students and asked how those students were doing. Those students have graduated from high school. One of the young ladies is in helicopter mechanics school. Another one is uh, the... the um, the, the young males is working over at Gallup and Ford, and the other three are actually still in the education process for the automotive field. So it's, you know, what we started here, their interest in that, it's, it, it's progressing. And uh, 
there is another employee that I had met there and had come through the program, the LAUSD program, and is now empl employed by the Department of General Services over in sanitation. And I hope we can get him to transfer over. But uh, there, is, there is some success and there's a lot of opportunity here. And uh, once this is up and running and we get it growing, I would love to bring some of these uh, students back. We're looking at expanding the program from five to 15 to uh, two shops in the San Fernando Valley and then one in the metro area. And uh, um, it's, it, it's a fantastic thing to, to see it in person, to see the students, to see them get their first paycheck. That was, that was pretty cool. So uh, if you have any questions for me, I, I love this program. I am so glad it came back before I retire and I, I wanna make sure it gets up and running the best I can. So thank you for your support on this. Anything, any questions for me? Thank you. No, I appreciate it. The R word is not a word that I enjoy hearing in this room. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna pretend you didn't say it. Um, I appreciate that endorsement. Uh, look forward to working with um, your teams regard on both understanding um, how we um, effectively institutionalize this, these kinds of efforts for maximum impact. Um, and, um, you know, it's a relatively, uh, you know, based on what we see in our agenda, small outlay. Um, but I, I think it's important that we apply the same kind of rigor to achieving our to implementation and achieving our outcomes or results, and that we be really clear what that outcome is. So it doesn't necessarily mean that every single person works here or necessarily mean that every single person works for the city of LA. If that's not our outcome, if it's broader than that, we just need to be very clear what the targets are. And track and, it. And then, and then track you know, the degree to which we're meeting those targets. Um, and we need to also um, understand how that works in the entire ecosystem of recruitment and training within the department um, so that it becomes, you know, so that we don't have a bunch of stuff that doesn't roll up into creating the impact that these efforts are supposed to impact. Commissioner Lair. Yes, sorry. For no, no, not at all, please. Um, the, I know LAUSD is very committed to also doing some work on, on their campuses. And, uh, you know, other than... So Are you talking the, about what kind of work? Well, I'm going to describe... No, uh, guy wanna, it, I yes, just want to yes, make sure uh, it's well, on the, on the campus as in making sure that water is retained on site, that you have rain gardens, that you plant trees, that you ideally do some solar powered mm -hmm. shade structures um, that can, you know, but also be- Lair, this is about a job training. This well, is but this a, is about- the, No, but, I'm, I'm, that, no? No. Okay. <laughs> Only because oh, yeah. this, is, this is an MOU related to the youth um, services program, um, as opposed to, um, more broadly, other ways that we can support LAUSD, which I'm happy to agendize, if that's what you would like. I mean, we can talk about that, mm -hmm. um, but I do want to make sure that we just stay on topic with respect to this program. Madam President, I'd like to move approval of the MOU, um, item number L2. Second. Uh, would you call the roll? Commissioner Romero? Aye. Lane Hill? Aye. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Four ayes, motion adopted. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, I think that that concludes our open session agenda and that we are uh, ready to go into closed session. We're gonna stay in this room. Uh, 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 Council, I assume that the magic words need to be spoken at this moment. Yes, the board shall recess into closed session for a conference with legal counsel regarding the items in section M of the agenda. The board shall publicly report any action taken in closed session and the vote or abstention of every member present thereon. In accordance with section 54957.1 of the California Government Code. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we are um, in moving to closed session. Uh, would you please uh, take care of the mics, Reggie? Yes, ma'am. Stand by, please.